Good evening, everyone. Thank cool, you for cool. being here. Sorry for the short delay. Um, I have a really special guest. I've been anticipating this for some weeks. I have Chris at Speaker's Corner, and uh, we've got some questions, and we're going to be talking about his experiences. I watch some of his work. It's really interesting, really great perspectives. So, uh, Chris, thank you very much for being here with me tonight. No worries. I'm very, very happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me. No, you're very welcome. Uh, to the audience, I trust that the audio is coming through loud and clear. Just give me a one in the uh, chat to make sure that everything is okay. Because I, I have a habit of a long, I have a long track record of, uh, you know, little technical disasters. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, it's always good to check. But yeah, it looks like uh, from what I can We're see, we're good. It looks yes. all good. Yeah, I damaged the cable recently. I, I damaged. The, luckily, it didn't damage the mic. I damaged the cable. I need to go pick up that cable tomorrow. I actually went today, and I, w I was really stressed to find other things, so I didn't get the cable. Um, but yeah, hey, so ah, we have okay. Kogito, we have Martin Allen, Villainous, Welcome, Anella, Dragon, Sergeant Grinch, all the uh, the usual suspects, and some new ones. Basil, get Welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. So, so Chris. Um, yeah, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do, your channel. And he is linked sure, in the title sure. and in the description. So please check him out and give him a, you know, give him a thumbs up and a subscribe. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. No, thank you, Lloyd. Yeah. Um, so first of all, before I begin, I just want to say that I'm just looking now at the stream. This background is really nice. <laughs> oh, thanks. Like really well done. Yeah. Re really good looking. Um, so, yeah, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Chris. Um, you can find me at Speaker's Corner. Um, Chris at Speaker's Corner is my channel. I am a Christian apologist who's been engaging with Muslims now for about two years. Uh, my original sort of background when I became a Christian, which was about, let me think, it was about 13 years ago, was actually as someone who was really interested in apologetics from an atheistic perspective, namely someone who wanted to defend the faith from atheism, from secular attacks. Yeah. And I also wanted to learn more about my faith in that, in that process, right? So I was buying lots of books, I was doing lots of reading, and then through basically meeting people at university, they sort of took me on and gave me discipleship, and they taught me uh, different things that are I, I could use like philosophy and history regarding Christianity and I I got really into it um, and then f after doing that for about four or five years I think I think uh, I came to the point where I was satisfied with what I had done I was kind of like hey I have learned all this stuff I've put it to good use I've been using it to spread the gospel I've been going out to people and evangelizing I am I'm done like I'm gonna take a break that there was I felt as if my calling was made maybe to something else and what was interesting is I found myself getting pulled back into this. And the reason I got pulled back into this was actually Jay Smith. It was, and I don't know how this worked, by the way. I, I think it might have been a sort of miracle of the YouTube algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may have been something to do with the fact that I was watching David Wood at the time. So maybe it came from him. But I found this Jay Smith video. And in this video, it was talking about the, it was when he was giving, um, a speech at a church, I think, or some kind of event. And it was giving a presentation about the early history of Islam. And I remember watching it and I remember thinking, there is no way that the second biggest religion in the world has that kind of messed up history. There is there is no way. And, and I already knew kind of from my own studies about the dangers of sort of revisionist history. But then I thought, well, even if a fraction of what this guy is saying is true, that that just blows the whole the whole thing apart. Mm -hmm. Like I, I wouldn't even know how you could continue being a Muslim at this point. And I had all these questions and I was I was intrigued by what this man was saying. And I started to watch more of his content and then eventually I got into um I found uh what's it called? DCCI. I found that channel on YouTube and then I found Hatton and then I found other people like Bob. And this was probably like after after a Ooh, like a year or so of finding Jay Smith. And then from then I spent many years looking at the kind of content that these guys were making. And I, I, was, I was just absolutely enthralled by it. And I got to see what the Muslim reaction was. Right. Because of all the stuff, you know, it's, it's happening in Britain, it's happening in the UK. This is like Speaker's Corner, right? So, uh, and I realized I actually lived like quite close by. And I thought, okay, I can actually go there. I can go to Speaker's Corner. 
and I can actually engage with these people and take all this information that I learn <laughs> and, and apply it and, and actually do like evangelism. And I thought, wow. And the more I prayed on it, the more I thought about it, and I thought, well, everything is lining up for me to do this. And it feels as if I'm being guided back to do apologetics and polemics. Mm -hmm. But this time, not in a secular, not against the secular world, but against the Islamic world. And I thought, wow, that, that's interesting. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I, I got brought into it. And, and from there, there was lots of like uh, funny stories about the first time I went there and and what kind of happened and the experience that I had. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the thing that originally got me into it. Okay, that's that's an interesting story. I would obviously want to, I mean, hopefully we'll talk about some of these stories as well. And hopefully we'll, we'll you know, touch on some of the, the interesting things. And as you know, I have some questions which I have, which we may or may not have a chance to get through. Uh, but hopefully this won't be the, the only time that we, we meet. Um, but yeah, I just thought it's, you, you are there. You are in the thick of it. You are actually dealing with these people who are on YouTube, you know, opposing the Christian worldview, opposing the Christian doctrine, um, spreading their own particular form of propaganda and so on. So, I mean, you are actually there dealing with people, you know, you have the courage to do so. I just, I'm just curious, how did you find the, the courage or to, to do so, to be willing to get up there and, and what kind of preparation does that take? To, to be willing to deal with clever arguments. I mean, long honed clever arguments designed to undermine yours. I mean, how did you decide to step into that ring? That's that's a really good point because, well, uh, there are a few things that jump to mind. The, the first is uh, my own personality is that I'm quite, um, so I can get into heated debates with people and never actually get emotionally involved. So I can just stay very, very, very calm, not not rise to that kind of level. And I do this with my own peers, but the people around me, people who know me for, for decades now, and, you know, it frustrates them. <laughs> oh, because we'll so then my audience will recognize so. you're not like me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this isn't to say that I'm, like, immune to this. Like, by all means, I'm not. Like, there are times when, you know, someone does get under my skin. But it's generally quite rare. And and for that reason, I think I, I kind of have a, a natural tendency to be able to do this. Um, what actually was a bigger thing, right, was was the crowds, because I'm used to debating one on one. I'm used to the Western style of debate, which is you have the empirical method. You know, it isn't a case of whoever shouts loudest wins or whoever is the most passionate wins. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I had to learn, and I, I can't remember who who it was that said this. Um, maybe it was David Wood. I'm not sure, but but it was something like. They don't value in in particular cult Islamic cultures the concept of intelligent, rational, calm argument. They value who is the most passionate about what they believe. And I think it actually may have been Nabil Qureshi that said that. But yeah, and I think you you find that at this at the park. There are people who are impressed by how loud you can yell takbir. Yeah, that that is a genuine <laughs> a genuine uh, point. Um, and sometimes like you have to kind of deal with that by having your own chance, having your own kind of uh, raising of your voice, calling people out on things, um, you know, and that's that was stuff that I had to learn. And it took me a while because it's it's difficult. It's not in my nature. It's not how I was raised. All right. Um, but hopefully I'm, a, I'm more sort of able to deal with that now than I was when I started. Yeah. I do want to mention that, that Jay Smith has had an impact on all of us. I remember watching Jay Smith and Hartun the first time this video pops up in my feed and I'm like, okay, fine. You know, like it said 25 different Qurans or whatever it was, 27. I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. Let's, let's have a watch. And I sat there and I'm like, good grief. If this is true, then what I've been believing for so long is false. Then what else is false? You know, th that just kind of yeah. cracked open the whole dam. Just, you know, it just, it just, the whole it's like the whole warehouse just got, someone just opened it and suddenly it's like, okay, let's start rummaging because something is, you know, the whole edifice, the whole facade just cracked right there. And yeah. Jay has really, he like, did everyone a service there. Mm. Oh, he did. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I, I remember that. I mean, I, I wasn't there at this point. This was long before I came to the corner, but I remember watching the videos of this and I was just thinking, wow, 
I do, the, the amazing thing was the camera captured the reactions of these of people. Like you saw Muslims genuinely terrified of, of what was happening. And you saw Mohammed Ijab come in and tell people to come away from him. Yep. Like, do not listen to this guy. Yeah. But in the like, Sharia, wow, they, they nice. have to avoid anything that causes doubt. They must reject it. They have to cause call the doubter a liar. And the information, even if true, must be considered lies. And they must remove themselves from it. So so this is within the Sharia. And then also you mentioned the the shouting to to show to convince people. This is also generally within the Sharia, where it's not about finding truth, it's about being persuasive. That's interesting. I, I one thing um I'm aware that uh, you've done a deep dive into this, and it's something that I haven't uh, myself yet done in, in that particular topic. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing it because I think it more than anything, I think it will kind of explain a lot to me about why this kind of cultural aspect, like, and then again, this is, it's not just one culture. These are many different cultures of whom all have Islamic influence. Yeah. You know, many it's the same thinking Pakistan, and the Afghanistan. thinking is, is, yeah. is formalized within the Sharia. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to, to see it played out. Um, right. There are things that, I just couldn't imagine people doing if they weren't part of the Islamic faith. Because you mean there are other people there, right? So that there are other, you know, you mean you have Christians, you have heretical Christians, you have heretical Muslims who are actually quite interesting because they tend to be the people that are the sort of more intelligent, rational kind of followers of Islam, so to speak, although they're not really following Islam. Yeah. Um, and you have like atheists and you have um, agnostics and all sorts. And the only there's only one group of people that has this kind of like monadic perspective of we are all one and we are all going to act in this way and if anyone ever loses we will all start yelling takbir or alo akbar at the, the top of our voices because we need to defend each other yeah that's and also within the sharia the muslim amazing. defends his brother uh, it, man mm. <laughs> that's, it's all it's all it's a set of rules it's just a set of rules that covers literally everything um yeah on this point I was, isn't, it, yeah. isn't it kind of go on. Go on. i was gonna say like isn't it amazing that they they have all this sort of embedded and taught at them taught to them from presumably a young age but they've probably never read the actual surya they, they have no actual understanding of it other than just the aspects of it that are taught and whatever i guess is convenient to leave out they just have no idea about yeah but somehow it's implicit if not explicit and um i want to say thank you to katie the native sister uh, Katie, native sister, for, for the donation. Thank you very, very much. I'm very grateful. She says, sorry, Lloyd, I haven't made it to your past few live streams. Busy work life. I'll have to come back to this one as well. God bless. Um, understandable. Um, you know, we, we have to work. I do understand, but I, I do appreciate the, the support. And, uh, you know, the videos are here when you need to follow them up and, uh, you know, come back to them whenever you're whenever you're ready. Um, but, but thank you, everyone else that is here. I really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, please pop your comments you know, uh, your questions in the com in the chat. <clears throat> we'll try and take them. I have a few things we want to get to. There's some questions. And um, and also, should we play that video? Just maybe kick off with that, the video, or the short that um, we spoke yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. So, guys, yeah, let me... Yeah, that's a good idea. Let me jump over here. Um, this is something that... This really impressed me. I watched this many times. But I just thought that to do this requires preparation. It requires skill. You know, study. Um you know, remembering remembering things that are important and being prepared for arguments. So I thought this is great. This this showcases Chris's skill and his ability to to really just silence people. I just thought people must have been shell shocked after this. And I'd love you to tell us more about this. Uh, so let me get the audio up and I'll I'll play this. Hey daughter, welcome, Kogito, welcome. And Anela uh, Damian Kuzmich uh, Kuzmich, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, Dragon, of course, I have to say thanks twice because you're you're so um, helpful and you know so uh, yeah so, so loyal to to everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's play this. There is ten kira'at of the Quran, and according to scholars, about thirty percent of that kira'at is different meanings in words. This is significant. He keeps saying there's one reading. That's a lie. He he actually said the phrase letter by letter. That's a lie. No one says that anymore. I've spoken to Mohammed Ijab. He doesn't have that view. Yeah, okay. No okay, one in scholarship hits. has the view you just, have. Just, it's really. just a Muslim oh, polemic oh, no, that is used fine. over and over again that doesn't conform with scholarship. It's just a lovely thing to tell Muslims. <laughs> Guys, it's not true. It's a lie. There's 10 kira out of your Quran. People argued about it. And that's, and that's totally different from the Aruf. People argued about the Aruf. And guess what? Where's the Aruf today? 
Where is it? Where's the seven modes of yeah, the different it? verses in the Quran that Muhammad revealed as revelation? It's gone. Why is it gone? Because Uthman probably burnt it. Why? Because in your Sahih Hadiths, Uthman burnt parts of the Quran. It says Quranic manuscripts. Where did that come from? It came from Abdullah ibn Masud, who had 111 surahs. It came from Ubay ibn Kaaba, who had 116 surahs. He can't address this, guys. There is 10 out of the Quran. And I'll pause that. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, I mean, should I, should I play this again? If the audience just let me know, uh, give me a one if I should replay that, but it's a brilliant piece of, of argument and logic. And, um, I, I just thought everyone's just shell shocked. It's like, they're just kind of like, how do we respond to this? Um, it so was, it was, it was a really, it was a really, sorry, go on, sorry, go on. Yeah, uh, see, there's a one. So let me play it again. Just, just so that everyone can, can have an overview of it again. And, um, and then I'll let you respond. Cause I mean, this is brilliant. According to scholars, about 30% of that kira'at is different meanings in words. This is significant. He keeps saying there's one reading. That's a lie. He, he actually said the phrase letter by letter. That's a lie. No one says that anymore. I've spoken to Muhammad Ijab. He doesn't have that view. No one in scholarship has the view you have. It's just a Muslim polemic that is used over and over again that doesn't conform with scholarship. It's just a lovely thing to tell Muslims. <laughs> Guys, it's not true. It's a lie. There's 10 kira'at of your Quran. People argued about it. And that's, and that's totally different from the Aruf. People argued about the Aruf. And guess what? Where's the Aruf today? Where is it? Where's the seven modes of the different verses in the Quran that Muhammad revealed as revelation? It's gone. Why is it gone? Because Uthman probably burnt it. Why? Because in your Sahih Hadiths, Uthman burnt parts of the Quran. It says Quranic manuscripts. Where did that come from? It came from Abdullah ibn Masud, who had 111 surahs. It came from Ubay ibn Kaaba, who had 116 surahs. He can't address this, guys. There is 10 Quran. Okay, so so that was that. So Chris, I mean, brilliant work. Uh, I'll just paste the link to that particular <clears throat> video again. Uh, so yeah, in the in so you mentioned Daif Bukhari and Daif Muslim. <laughs> so, do you want to tell us a bit more about that? I mean, that was brilant. Uh, so uh, so yeah yeah. Um, in, this, um, in, this in this particular, particular debate, debate, I managed, I managed to have the debate with Daif Abbas. Abbas who, who um, um, you can often, you see, can often see in my speaker's corner. They have a little stand and you can kind of see it in the background of the video. Uh, and it says, you know, they quote supposed experts on Islam who are usually white and Western. And, you know, they quote them saying how amazing Islam is and how there's only one Quran and it's uncorrupt and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been studying uh, for quite a while now is just the idea that actually, even in the Islamic uh, traditions, there's a very early understanding that the Quran is not just one. Mm -hmm. There are different people with their own codices. And you, you could hear in the video I talk about Ubay ibn Kab, who has 116 surahs, and Abdullah ibn Masud, who has 111. And these two people are said to be some of the master reciters of the Quran, according to Muhammad, in Sahih uh, Hadith. And, you know, uh, in a debate, I bring this reference up. And the, the fact of the matter is, there is Islamic narrations, particular hadith that is sahih beyond a doubt, that in their histories, there was early doubt about the Quran, about how it's being recited, about what is being recited, and what should happen to standardize that Quran into a single uh, Qureshi dialect. Right. And all this is Sahih, and yeah, like uh, bringing it up during the debate, he w he didn't really have much of an answer. Um, it was quite quite good to um, <laughs> to see that he didn't have much of an answer for this. Uh, he he tried defending it in the typical way. I think what was really devastating was that I talked about the uh, Aruf and how there's these seven different modes of recitation, mm -hmm. and yeah, even within the same tribe, there are people disagreeing about what the recitation means. So it's not just a case of dialect, because they would have had the same dialect, right? They're both speaking Arabic, they're both from the same tribe, yet the Sahih Hadith that says, oh, actually, um, two people had to go to Muhammad. I think one of them dragged the other person to Muhammad to ask him about what this guy's saying. And Muhammad says, don't worry about it. It's been revealed in one way, and it's been revealed in this other way. Both are valid. And when you have that in your narrations, there is no way you can say there isn't different Qurans. Because evidently they thought they were different words and this was a problem. Otherwise, they wouldn't have, uh, one of them wouldn't have dragged the other one in front of Muhammad and made him uh, recite what he said. And um, part of that as well is the fact that this Aruf has been lost. 
We don't know what this our roof is. Oh, we do, we do, we do. do. Right. They just, it's convenient not to know. Because, uh, actually, hold on, hold on. You see, there's there's a few, hold on. Um, First, a question from Horse. Uh, I keep hearing a newer response. We don't accept anything that goes against the Quran. Is this in any way effective? I keep hearing a new response. We don't accept anything that goes against the Quran. No, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, so... The problem is, this is kind of how I see Muslims uh, adapting in the Western world. They take what the Quran says as their final authority, and they reject things that are inconvenient to it, even if it means condemning the actual deen of Islam. What they now effectively have is a westernized, modernized, um, much more safer, much less spicy, much less uh, revolting in a lot of ways, deen. It is a totally new religion. It, it, it's in effect Islam 2.0. Yeah. They cannot actually stick to what Islam really is. And I mean, there's been well, they some cannot admit to what Islam Bible. really is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they, 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 they cannot be honest about it because I think it's indefensible. Yeah. Right. You cannot in the Western world defend the, the, the practices of Muhammad, for example. That's, that's indefensible. Yeah. Villainous makes um, a strong they, point. They base... uh, apologies, please, please go on. Oh, uh... No, I was going to say, like, um, the things that Muhammad did are indefensible. The things that he says as supposed knowledge are just indefensible, right? Uh, so there's the Sahih Hadith that says that um, you shouldn't drink while you're standing up. You should actually vomit if you do that. Yeah, you... Which, of course, is incredibly strange to think of this, but it's in a Sahih Hadith. Exactly. And then you have the dumping of the flies. Like, if a fly lands on your drink... Uh, one wing has a cure, the other wing has a disease. So dunk it in, and then it's safe to consume. Yeah. Like this is. I know it's it's just it's it's completely know. bizarre. But um, villainous SSB says abrogation implies that the Quran is not fully accepted, which which is true. In fact, according to the Sharia, but this is implied within the reliance. But it's been it's it's itself been uh, snipped out, been removed. But the Quran is effectively superseded. And and also, can you see what's on the screen there, Chris? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Have a look at what's highlighted. Um, you, you can ignore this. Okay, I'll, so, let's just take this away. But look at what's highlighted, and then look at what's on the bottom. Just read that, if you would. Uh, just read it aloud, and you just uh, the first section up top. So starting from the top, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is half. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Half. Arabic. A letter of the alphabet. Mm. Um, word. A Quranic reading dialect. So, so this is correct. So, so this is a this is a meaning. Now, this is the Encyclopedia of Islam. It's the gold standard um, academic reference to everything Islam, written by hundreds of scholars over more than a century. So you have hundreds and hundreds of contributors. So, so Ahruf is the plural of Harf, and it does mean letter of the alphabet. It does mean word. It does mean Quranic reading. It does mean dialect. And you can see that. You can go to volume 3, 204B, column B. You can go to volume 3, 205B that for A meaning. And then you'll find a short paragraph describing it. The, the lengthiest discussion and the main meaning is, check the bottom, read the bottom. Okay, so this is Ilam al uh, Onomatop Onomatomancy? Yes, onomatomancy. word. <laughs> A magical practice based on the occult properties of the letters of the alphabet and of the divine and angelic names of which they form. Did they? Did the Muslims explain well, that to you? That it's a form of no, magic? Huruf, no. Akhruf is actually a form of magic. Oh, wow. You know what? Funny enough, they never bring this up. <laughs> now, why do you think they're like, we have no idea what it means? You know, nobody knows. Well, you're just going to ask the scholars. You know, have you consulted a scholar? It was really good advice. You go and consult the scholars, you discover that the main meaning, the main application of the science of the words. See, the ilm is science, right? The science of words, onomatomancy, a magical practice. We can go to volume 3, 595b. There's a couple of pages. There's a whole couple of pages dedicated to this. And it's about how the Quran has, has earth letters, fire letters, like earth, air, fire, and water, as well as sun and moon letters. It is their own form of gematria. It is their own form of utilizing magical incantations 
to it's basically a gnostic practice where if you know the secret name of god you can you can invoke the spirit and make them do things on your behalf either prevent them from harming you or make them do things for you so it's uh, it's, it's called theurgy and this is discussed and interestingly when you go through the encyclopedia of islam i'd say easily 40 percent of the encyclopedia of islam refers to that every almost every reference that you have has like one meaning but it also has a magical occult meaning so about 40% of these references are all to do with magic, some form of Islamic magic. And so this is actually, the main meaning is actually magic, the use of um, of incantations and magical practices. And for instance, they say that Allah has 99 names, which is a complete, it's a misdirection. Allah has 99 attributes or qualities. Allah only has one name. We don't know what that name is because Allah is a descriptor Allah is a secret name, but if you know the secret name of Allah, you can you can make him do your bidding, which is what the Gnostics believed if you had the names of the eons. So this is so Allah has a secret name. <clears throat> the scholars know what it is. We don't. So your thoughts on that? That's that's really interesting. You know, um I've I've seen you reference the encyclopedia. Is it the Encyclopedia of Islam? This is, yeah. Is that is that this one? Yeah, I've I've been meaning to give this, I mean, as much as I can, a read or or just to go over some things because there seems to be so many times, like you said, the the normal understanding that we think it is or that Muslims tell us of a particular word isn't actually what it is. Right. <laughs> it, it's actually something completely different. And yeah, I've seen you do this a few times, and it, it reminds me that I should uh, I should look into this more yeah. and, and challenge. Yeah. What the what the definition so is. So for those, you can see it says here, volume 3, page 595B. So uh, I'm not going to go there right now, but for those in the description, please have a look at my research archive. It's on Google Drive. Um, so here are, I've got stuff on atheism. I've got over 1,500 references. These are scientific papers. These are books. These are history texts. These are maps, atlases, references, you name it. And if you go to Islam... You're going to find I've got scholars from the 1800s, which have been almost forgotten. Ahmadiyya books. I've got, you name it. I've got a ton of stuff here. I have, as I said, 1,500 plus references. And you can find the Encyclopedia of Islam stuff under my dictionaries references folder. Go to the references and um, and actually go and see what it says about the Akhruf. And in fact, they have a form of magic. They're called Samiya. Have you heard of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's, I've heard of it before. It's vaguely yeah. they've got something that's vaguely in that line, um, but it's more like it, it. You can interpret it as conversational hypnosis. So they've got a form of magic wow. called Samia, which is part of their science of words, science of letters, science of speaking. Ilam al Khuruf. It's it's called Samia, and it's a way of casting spells. Of basically baffling people and persuading, convincing them. So they they have. So this is much deeper than people realize. And um, so there's a lot more going on than folks are aware of. That's interesting. I, I just want to say um, I've used your your little reference library there for a lot of things. Um, so for example, the the earliest Sira from Ibn Asak, mm -hmm. the Life of Muhammad, uh, the English translation of that. I've I've used that many times, um, and there's still treasure to be found in that. Um, the Shira, uh, the Sharia, sorry, as well for the different references, particularly for the different fic, because something that I've been trying to do for a while now is, I, I think everyone is quite familiar with the reliance of the traveler. It's the sort of well known, and if you mention it to Muslims, they're aware of it too. They know it exists, but there's all sorts of stuff. Um, I think it's the Al Hidayah. Uh, and I yeah. want to look at, they want to look at the other uh, Sharia references for the different schools, because quoting the um, the the Shafi school is one, but then you have the other three as well, and it's good just to yeah Hanafi, yeah, Hanbali, and Maliki. Hey. They are they are simply just different. Yeah. It's like think of it as four different Akhruf or Kiraat. It's kind of the same vibe. It's all the same, just slightly different views on the same things. Um, yeah, on this uh, maybe I should yeah <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I was just gonna say yeah. I think I remember what you said once that. All, they basically all say the same thing because one of the things that they often try and do is say, ah, well, this is one school of fic, but, you know, I don't belong to that school of fic. So that means this doesn't apply to me. You know, the, the school I'm part of, I don't know, the Maliki school. Yeah, that's totally different. It doesn't say these things. 
But yeah, for, for my own looking into it, you're right. It it still does. <laughs> no, it does. Because um, they, they often say most of the same things. No, they do. They might have slight differences, but they are fundamentally the same. It's the same religion. So it's, um, yeah, on that point, I, I'll move over to those questions that we have. So for the audience, um, I've got a list of questions here, um, which I thought would be great for discussion with, uh, as you can see, Chris's channel is called Chris at Speaker's Corner right there. And this is his logo. And um, so I've got some questions and we're happy to to take your questions as well. And Anela asked, is it something like like hypnosis? And the answer would be yes. It, it would be something in that line, a form of persuasion. And uh, so I've got a bunch of questions and I discovered that Chris is not a real Scotsman as we were going through the questions earlier. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah yeah i need to uh more monty python i need to need to watch yeah yeah it's been a, a while yep yeah, so so we did we discussed already what inspired you to come to be i mean would you like to add anything more to that number one <clears throat> um or i guess, well, I guess let's do number two maybe i've been happy with yeah sure sure uh so oh yeah what are they oh speaking of speakers corner yeah it was the fact that Everything was telling me I need to go there and share this knowledge. Um, people ask me this at Speaker's Corner sometimes. And the response I give is, well, I find myself watching these videos, right, from so-called films, from DCCI. And I found that I was spending like a couple of hours after a video researching everything in the video. So, you know, the, the Dai, if it's in a Muslim engagement, might say something like, oh, you know, the Bible's been corrupt or the Quran is perfectly preserved or there's only one Quran and all those sorts of things. And I found that out of pure like desire, I wanted to know the answers to these questions and to a level where I could address it if I was there. And then I thought, well, I'm, I'm noticing myself do this for fun, basically. And now I'm like, well, I can go there. And I can actually try out these things. Um, so I decided to do that. And, and then I, I sort of started going to the corner kind of undercover. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't really know anyone there or anything, but... I, I was there talking to some people, asking sort of very subtle questions, particularly to Muslims. And they were very friendly, um, really friendly. Uh, when you're not a known speaker and you just turn up to the corner as a Christian, they are incredibly friendly to you. They, you know, they'll gladly have a chat with you. You know, to be honest with you, I, I would actually say I kind of made in some loose sense friends there. Um, they, they talk to you really nice and they try and give you answers and even about the most uh, difficult of topics, you talk about Aisha, for example. As long as you're respectful, and especially if you do it in, in uh, what you call it, in private, you, you you ask them in private, they'll, they'll give you their best answer. I mean, it's not very good, but they'll do their very best to do it. And uh, I, I actually got into a case once when I had some Muslims that... I, I upset a Muslim because I, I pointed out Aisha, right? And I did it in front of an atheist, and this guy did not like this at all. He really did not like this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, as, far uh, as far as he was concerned, I've just ruined his ch his chances of doing Dawa to this atheist. Mm. And he starts like yelling all things at me. He starts trying to, you know, insults me. He does all this stuff. And then another Muslim who I met before came, heard this, came in, into the conversation, heard what this guy was saying to me. He asked like for both of our sides of what, what's going on. I explained to him I didn't mean to insult. He's taken it badly. He said, oh, you know, he's insulted the prophet. And this other third-party Muslim said, no, no, no. The Muslim is in the wrong. Chris has done nothing wrong here. And I thought, oh, wow. That's, that's actually, <laughs> that's actually quite nice. I was like, that's kind of amazing. Um, and so it, it kind of goes to show you that, well, two things. One, that Muslims will try and take you under their wing, you know, if they don't know that what you're... Um, your intent to evangelize and if they think you're somewhat naive perhaps or perhaps a little bit uh not not too because uh too aware of certain things but also that you know if you're if you talk with them honestly about things like even just things away from religion you know you can you can actually have uh these people be friendly to you you know there is a human element to all of these things. now of course i just think but, that look alone it's one thing but once in a group peer pressure that that Yes. group element and suddenly they realize that there is a threat to them in one way or another and they they, they need to fall in line absolutely i mean i've oh yeah in the but, middle east i dated mm. muslim girls and and they were quite literally afraid for their lives i mean literally afraid for their lives if they were discovered so many people in the middle east 
live double lives. And interesting. And yeah, that that's um, yeah. It's just really. I mean, this is one of the things that that made me kind of like wonder what's going on here. You know, um, number three, I've got like, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing Christianity today, and and the biggest challenge to your ministry at at Speakers Corner. Biggest challenges facing Christianity today. Well, there's quite a, quite a lot, really. One of them. I mean, it depends what nation you're talking about, right? Or what culture? You're I, I guess about. maybe we can sort of keep um, it in terms of your experience, like like limited basically to your experience, rather than, well, you know, um, you've got the aliens from from Plex Store Five that are undermining <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church, while on the other hand, you've got the Bigfoot <clears throat> Illuminati Alliance that are undermining the 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 Dutch Reformed and the other Protestant denominations, you know, with George Soros money, and let, let's let's not go there, right? Let's just, in terms of your experience like at the, Speaker's Corner, mm, Bigfoot Alliance, though. Yeah. Um, but look, on this um, point, though, I will say that I everyone knows and everyone asks me, but I keep saying it and I keep getting asked. I I grew up in the Anglican Church, right? But I have a serious problem with where the Anglican Church is going because recently they've started to affirm that. Well, you know, we, we we believe that we will start affirming a gender neutral God. You know, God will be a they them. And I'm like I'm like, I didn't sign up for this nonsense. You know? So yeah. so yeah, I've yeah. got issues there. I mean that's one issue I certainly do have. But let, let's keep it sort of maybe focused on, on your 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 personal, you know, in interaction at Speaker's Corner. So I think one of it is um is division caused by groups. So one thing that has always been an issue is Christians that refuse to work with each other because they refuse to act in a, I guess you'd say, an ecumenical way. They, so for example, it might be someone, and this is not to pick on any particular group, but there might be someone who's uh, very much Protestant, for example, and very much against Catholic teaching. And there might be someone who's Catholic who's very much against Protestant teaching. And it will come to the point where they they simply won't, won't have anything to do with one another or worse yet there'll be there'll be strange situations in which one uh christian will say to like a muslim or an atheist don't listen to that christian because that christian's a catholic or that christian's a protestant and you end up with this kind of like uh to use a to use a commonly said muslim phrase backbiting where christians are stopping each other from evangelizing effectively and it causes issues because the only way you actually kind of survive at speaker's corner is in unity you, if you go there alone and you try and do things alone, mm -hmm. I don't know how you would do that without having someone who's got your back. Okay. And I think the, the only way you do that is by working together. So for me, and at least from the corner's perspective, and it goes beyond that, the fact that we, we have these sub-Christian identities and we have these denominations of which we are unwilling to even uh, put aside for the sake of evangelism to those who are completely lost. And I mean, I'm talking about Muslims or outright heretical faiths, I think is just damaging. Right. So you're saying um, that the people's front of Judea and the Judean people's front need to put aside <laughs> their differences and and merge as one for group. For ecumenical reasons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If only they could just come together. So they should become the front of the people alliance. of Judea. <laughs> Yes, exactly that, exactly that. <laughs> you know, there's there's a place for like interfaith dialogue. Uh, well, say interfaith. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interdenominational dialogue, right? Or and there's a place for you in your funny. face dialogue, but <laughs> which is the speaker's corner. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like, um, I think that's that's just totally fine. And for, from my point of view, I've always wanted to start doing um, sort of this ministry at Speaker's Corner because I want to reach others who are not Christian. They don't acknowledge Jesus as, as their Lord and Savior. That, to me, seems to be the highest priority. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things are made muddy, like the the waters are made muddy, as if the sun had set into this pool of uh, muddy water. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, like uh, <laughs> the sun would never do that. Uh, Nobody would make that claim, Chris. I don't know. You know, I've, I've heard it somewhere. I'm not sure where. <laughs> no, no, no way. But Especially yeah. not not in your religion of science and knowledge, with Hikma, you know, <laughs> guarding it. The the best of Hikma, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd say that's kind of the reason why. Like, um, yeah, you, you know, you need you need people who are willing to put their differences aside. You can argue about Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox stuff, you know, after Speaker's Corner, but as Speaker's Corner. 
we have a job to do. And it's to reach the Muslims and it's to reach the lost. So Okay, now that's fantastic. I mean, thank you. This is really I mean, it's really interesting the things you have to say. I mean, you're there. And it's weird that that you 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 actually have very you're a very calm energy. You're not aggressive. Even though you're in an environment that seems, at least to me from the outside, to be fairly potentially aggressive and and very It's it's incredibly aggressive like uh just the stuff that you see is uh yeah you need to have a stomach for it um so to case in point right you, you're aware that hatton was stabbed um at some point yeah, it was last yeah, year no so i met hatton for the first time the week before and i came up to her and i said and this is like when i was in incognito mode i had only been there for a few few uh a few point, a few uh, days. No, sorry, a few weeks at this point, but no one knew who I was. But I went up to her and I said, "Hey, um, you know, I just want to let you know that I absolutely love what you're doing, and I think you know you're you're very brave for doing what you're doing." And she was like, "Oh, thank you," you know. And then we went we went our separate ways. I didn't go to the corner the next week, and that was the week in which she was stabbed. And wow! That that absolutely it it made me realize very clearly of what. I'm actually engaging with here by going to this place because no matter what you see, because there are times when it's a really nice place. There are times when people are just, you know, having a nice discussion where everyone has their own little groups. Cause a lot of it, people just stick to their own groups for the, especially the Muslims. The Muslims try more than they ever have done to just stick into their own little group. They have their own little stall. Now they gather around that stall. They, they don't usually go off from that place, but you know, when it does and, and, and you hear people, I mean, there, there are people that just get commonly assaulted, right? There's a guy called Victor, um, who's this guy that goes there to heckle. That, that's his whole purpose. He goes there to yell things about Muhammad, right? So, for example, <laughs> one of the things he will yell is Muhammad is a, and then you can fill in that word, begins with the letter P. A fido pile. And he'll just keep, pedo pile. A fido yeah, pile, a fido one, pile. Yeah. A PDF file. <laughs> uh, He's a PDF, PDF file. file. Yeah. <laughs> he's Adobe. Reader. He's not a Word document. Um, he's a PDF <laughs> file. <laughs> and and you know that's what he does. That that's his thing. Um, but he's very loud. You know, sometimes people have to move away because he's quite loud. Okay. But the level of abuse this man has got, I cannot even begin to describe. You you've got Muslims that have hit him, have kicked him, have pushed him. There was a video not long ago I watched where there was a a cameraman, a Muslim cameraman who he had the flash on his camera. And he was like taking pictures with the flash on in his eyes, like just repeatedly over and over again. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was horrible. Like some of the things that you'll see. You know, actually, you're making me I'll, I'll go to something. Uh, you've just made me think of something. <clears throat> um, let me get this for you. Seven one three. Apparently, it is. Nearly there. You know, it helps uh, notice. I don't know if you can see this coming up because the lag, I think, is only a couple of seconds, like four or five seconds. And Islam in Tiro Verdad, thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm really grateful for the donations. Thank you very much. It's very kind of all of you. I, I really do appreciate this. Um, Chris, can you see what's on the screen there? Yes, I can. Yep. It speaks of degrees of severity. Now, this is in reference to the fundamental doctrine of Islam, which few people know about. It's called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. To command the right is to command what is considered good within the Sharia, and forbidding the wrong is to forbid anything that opposes the Sharia. And just have a look. It says here, they need to do the following. Now, look, this is a, a suggested order. It is not a... It's not a... Um, let's just say they can, they, they, can skip the, they can skip the queue if they like. Right. Right. Okay. But just yeah. just read through the list, just so that you can get a feeling for it. This is what Muslims are supposed to do in response to, you know, people not obeying the Sharia, even non-Muslims. <laughs> right. Let's give it a go. <clears throat> so we have this, uh, the top one here: knowledge of the wrong act, and then we have explaining that something is wrong, and then forbid the act verbally, censor with harsh words, writing the wrong by hand, intimidation. Assault, force of arms. Wow, interesting. interesting. Uh, notice interesting. that intimidation, writing the wrong by hand comes before intimidation. I mean, what, what do they mean by writing the yeah. wrong by hand? It's like, hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not even sure how how that works. How how do you do action without without intimidating? Yeah. And I don't know, when, maybe, you, when they speak of yeah. harsh words, they mean abuse. They mean abusive language. You blah 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 bleep 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 bleep. That is censuring with harsh words. It's not to censor; it's to censure, which is to 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 revile, to abuse, with harsh words. And then, right the wrong by hand is to destroy things, to damage things, to hit, to kick. Then intimidation is to use a group to say, look, if you do this, there's going to be, it would be a shame if you, if these nice, these are nice windows, it would be a shame if they all got broken. Assault is obviously wow. assault. Typically, this is when you have a group. And then force of arms is, okay, well, if, if uh, you know, if the old, uh, Baseball bats and fists and boots didn't quite suffice, then, well, you might have to scale it up a little bit. This is what Muslims are supposed to do for the religion of peace. This is part of, this is their most important doctrine. Wow. Wow. And you know what? I, the more I think about it, this is exactly what you see at Speaker's Corner. That There is like an escalation of, of things. Um, and the Hatun is kind of the, the walking like light of this. She comes in, and she's just a small, small Turkish woman. You know, there's, there's, there's not anything particularly <laughs> threatening about her. The only thing is, is that she has the wrong T-shirt. She has a T-shirt with uh, Charlie Hebdo cartoons on it, mm. and they can't deal with her in argument. They can't stop her from coming. So what do you do? Well, guess you write the wrong by hand. You use intimidation, assault, and force of arms. Yeah. And it's, uh, so this is the, yeah. And obviously, this goes into a great deal of detail, but the fact that this is a religious practice, force of arms and assault are religious practices. I mean, like, okay, what kind of religion are we dealing with here? Yeah, a very scary. Was one. Satan in your nose well, there? And Chris? also a very weak Was one. Satan in your nose? <laughs> yeah, yes, a little bit. I, uh, I've had Satan in my nose for, for the last week now with uh, with the flu. I don't know. Maybe you need but, to dip uh, a fly or something. I don't know. So someone. <laughs> oh, actually, actually, you say that. I had, uh, there wasn't, was it, is it Adjua dates? I always forget Adjua. the first part uh, of it. Ad... Uh, that's it. Yeah. I had, uh, I had some different dates. I think they were Majula dates or something, but I've had some of those today. Probably more than four. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe that'll help. Uh, Stop me catching anything else. I, I hope so. I, I hope so. So good luck. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So let me see. Um, uh, I, th I think we've generally dealt with question number three. Um, I mean, well, just a short yeah, answer, yeah. but your, well, what are the biggest challenges to your ministry at, at Speaker's Corner? Do you have any serious challenges that you want to sort of draw attention to? The things that are biggest stumbling blocks for you there, personally? Um. Actually, I talked about one already, which was the sometimes unity is challenging. Yes. When you have Christians, you know, all places, it's difficult to maintain unity. Uh, difficult uh, challenges to to my ministry. Okay, there, there are a few. Um, so it, it does it does cost me to actually do this. Like, I actually have to travel to there. Okay. Um, I don't live in London anymore, so I'm now fronting the cost um, to travel every week and, and actually do this. Um, that's not a problem. It's just, you know... A challenge to me. So, okay. Um, so then to the audience, I mean, this does cost um, the, the work that I do, the work that Chris does, the work that all of us do. It does demand time. It demands time away from family. It demands time away from work and other responsibilities. You know, that limited time and it, there is a cost involved. I Mal had to buy books. Um, you know, I have to buy books. I have to buy equipment. I had to replace cameras and and as Chris mentioned, so so please, um, if you can, go to Chris's channel. I mean, and subscribe, follow him. And if you can support the, the content creators that, that you like, please do, because it, it does make a difference. It, it really does. Um, you know, it, it's something that, that, that genuinely makes a difference and helps and motivates. And um, we do incur costs for this kind of work. So if you can support Chris, please do. You know, and I, I'm grateful for the support I get. I mean, I'm really grateful. And that helps me to do what I'm doing. And um, by the same token, if you can support Chris, um, if you like his work, you know, please, please do support him if you can. I know times are not always easy, but, but um, do bear that in mind. So thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can go to number four. Yeah, I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, where do you see us having the greatest impact on handling Islamic polemics and causing doubt in its followers? Um, yeah, so I think we have had in the last few years uh, an ama- amazing amount of push on, on Islamic polemics. I think we've done immense damage to the Da'is, their arguments. Right. The best way that you can see this is the fact that they don't want to talk anymore, like with anybody. Um, it used to be the case that they would say, we don't want to talk to Hatun because Hatun offends us. Okay. And it was like, okay, fine, that's fine. And then it changed to, we don't want to talk to anyone who associates with DCCI, which is the ministry that Hatun <laughs> is the head of. It's like, okay, all right, well, that, that's a few more people. Okay, fine. And then it became, we don't want to associate with either DCCI or SOCO. Now, just so you guys know, um, that SOCO and DCCI are basically the only two main channels there. Uh, there are other channels, but they're more sort of independent or less, uh, less well known. And for, for that reason, what they've effectively now done is they've barred anyone who's a frequent member or I guess frequent uh, partaker of Speaker's Corner who's a Christian. So if you happen to go there and you go there quite a bit, they, they won't really want to talk to you anymore. What they are now doing is they are now targeting people they have never seen before who have turned up as a tourist or as someone who's uh, intrigued to see what happens at Speaker's Corner. Maybe from like, maybe they heard about it. Maybe they visited in the UK and they want to see, hey, what's this place called Speaker's Corner? It sounds really cool. Let's check it out. Um, and they turn up and they find these people. They then bring them to a dai, and then that dai basically gives them a lecture for about half an hour, where the dai speaks most of the time. And you can see this, by the way, if you watch their videos, you'll notice that they they actually don't the the person um, who's talking to the dai doesn't speak much at all. Hmm. Rather, it's just a dai giving them this big, long, prepared speech about how Islam is great. Muhammad was a feminist, you know, um, just uh, all these, you know, there's only one Quran is perfectly preserved. Uh, Muhammad was the greatest example to all, you know, Christian uh, Christianity makes no sense because it's about the Trinity and how can one be three? And that, that's basically all there is. And you'll notice as well that all of their polemics are just about Christianity. Like if they want to give dawah to an atheist, they'll do it on the back of Christianity. They'll always start off by saying, Hey, let's talk about Christianity. So they Why don't actually defend Islam. They just attack Christianity. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can even watch. When they get people to take the shahada, because this is what they do, right? They'll give them a speech for 30 minutes, and the person is just nodding their head thinking, gosh, why on earth did I come here? This was a big mistake. I should never have come to Speaker's Corner. The Dai will then say, now, does, does that sound interesting to you? And out of politeness, they'll say something like, yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, Islam sounds sounds interesting. And they'll say, do you want to take shahada? <laughs> are you prepared now to say these words? And I'll tell you what the words are. You won't know what they mean. They won't be in a language you speak, but don't worry about it. That's fine. Say these words in Arabic, and then you'll be a Muslim. And don't worry, uh, being a Muslim just means you believe in one God. That's all it means. That's all it means. And they'll say this, like, like Islam basically means nothing to these guys. Like the, when they when they give their their, uh, their dawah, Islam is just uh, a synonym for there is a god. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Um, wow. And so they'll get them to say it on camera. They'll get all these people to be like, "Hooray!" You know, "Allahu Akbar," and they'll clap their hands and everything. And then they'll consider this a victory. And the person goes away wondering what on earth they had just done. <laughs> and that's and that's dawah at speaker's corner. Um, it's kind of it's kind of funny in a way, because you contrast this with the Christian way, right? And the Christians actually engage in conversation with people. We actually, like, we don't say, right, I've just had a, a a talk with you about Jesus and what he did for us. Now, are you ready to become a Christian? Say these words, and as soon as you say these words, ta-da, it's done. And then we all go home, and it's all great. It's like, no, it's it's a lot more to it than that. There's You can't just expect people to make radical changes in life based off a few words that you said and, and having your mates around you clapping like seals behind you. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So they, they, the, the way they're doing it now is they follow that method. That's how they are dealing with polemics in the park. It's don't engage with them. We can't answer why Allah is in the, uh, is above the throne and also in the lowest heaven. We can't answer that. It's a logical problem. We can't explain and how Allah has two right hands. Yeah. Oh, uh, actually, you know, what's great. actually there is an answer to that. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. 
yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let you speak in a second. But what you can do is you can say to the, just ask generally in the crowd of Muslims, does Allah have body parts? And just watch the absolute chaos it causes. Like there, there are Muslims that will immediately turn around and say, of course not. Allah does not have body parts. And then the other Muslims who are a little bit more aware will say, yes, but we don't affirm how um, Billah Cave. <laughs> so, and then the, the, those two Muslims will then argue with each other over which one is correct. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting and, and is the guy, that... The guy who... Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a... I'm busy working on something on Ethiopia, uh, which has been taking longer than expected uh, because it, it's turning into a little bit of a, of a theological investigation. Um, going back to the founding of the church and to the early councils like Nicaea. Uh, as you know, Nicaea is where the gray aliens came down and the Bigfoot Illuminati gray alien alliance was formed where they decided to take over the world through the Roman Catholic Church. And um, they installed a of course a robot as, as the Pope. But this robot was programmed to take over the world. And um, at least so I'm told by very by people who know. You know, people with hikma. This is Sahih Abu Kali version. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but on that point, the idea that Allah has, um, so it all goes back to the word tawheed, and uh, I'm going to have to be careful here because Villainous is uh, we, Villainous. You mentioned previously the the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhid Church, right? Which which uh, for them the term Tawhid was used to refer to the unity of Christ. Okay, one essence, two natures, right? Human and divine. So there's the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhid Do Church. Now in Islam, Tawhid, you just mentioned, Tawhid is very important in Islam. Allah, you know, he's he's one, one essence. But it's like the monad, right? Indivisible. It's it's not so it's Gnostic, it's not Christian. But whereas the, the term Tawhid Do, the Islamic term Tawhid comes from the same source, comes from the from, from the Ethiopian Taw Tawhid Do, which is actually the how the Ethiopian church A refers to Jesus as being of two natures, but unified. But the word actually doesn't specifically mean that. The, the original word simply is unified in essence to a complex unity, to, to join multiples into one. And its original meaning is monotheism. So it originally technically refers to, to God, the, the essence of God, the Godhead, right? But the, the church, the Ethiopian church uses it in application in terms of the nature of Jesus. And they are strict tr Trinitarians. And the Muslims have taken that concept from Christianity. The word is actually borrowed from, from t effectively Christianity, right? Or from a biblical, a Hebrew source, even prior to the Ethiopian. But on that, where they say that Allah has two right hands, they don't mean two literal right hands. They mean Allah has two correct hands. Those two correct hands will be the Son and the Holy Ghost, who are both right, who are both good. Does that make sense? It's allegorical. It's not literal. Yeah, that is interesting. So, so would you say the the original intent, <clears throat> like uh, going back to the earliest days of Islam, was for them to have that view, and now they have changed. Now they have a totally different view. The the entire Christology of like... Islam is heretical and Gnostic. It's a blend of of these. It's built on a pagan foundation, from what I've learned from what I've shown in my monotheism series. But it looks like the early Muslims, they were pseudo-biblical, messianic, Jewish believers, and they were non-Trinitarians. So that, that would seem that they kind of strongly, because if you start to investigate the, the early history of Gnostic belief, the, the very earliest Gnostic groups, those ideas consistently travel through the centuries. So even though there's different groups, they tend to have the same beliefs, oddly enough. And so the, the, it looks like they've taken from a a non-Trinitarian heretical source. Yeah, I, I definitely, like, I've been thinking about this for a while, and it's largely in part of some of the videos that I've seen you do when you talk about the, the background and the origins of these things. But yeah, the it does seem as if it, it, it comes from some heretical angle. I mean, there's there's so much like data to try and like reconcile, because if you look at it from just the the Quran as a perspective, whoever wrote it had, or the authors that wrote it, knew things, but they didn't know enough, or they knew things and they were challenging the the position of the church, and it's interesting to see like exactly what what 
they were originally trying to do and trying to figure that out. Yeah, no, definitely. It's worth it's worth actually talking about. As people have said, it might be worth discussing. I'm busy working on this. I mean, look, there, there's a degree of speculation here, right? There's There's been change throughout history. So so it's not like this was all written in stone, shall we say. But but there's there's a degree of, of coherent connecting of the dots, what seem like logical leaps of exegesis and so on. Um, but, but yeah, Hey, welcome Thaddeus. Glad to have you here. Thank you for showing up. Um, yeah, guys. So, so do like, and, um, you know, share it, let people know about this. Chris, welcome. Good to see you, Chris Azure. Um, yeah. So, so would you say that the work that Jay has done that he started doing and that Mal then did and that myself and others, do you think that, that this historical approach is really causing doubt and causing impact on these guys? Because you say that they are starting to retreat. They are no longer defending Islam. In like three or four years, yes. literally yes. nobody has been willing to come up and meet with me just to talk about the Sharia, just to go through it. They'll all say I'm wrong, but I'm saying, okay, fine, bring your books, let's do this. Let's talk about it. And nobody will do that. So you think we are, we've got them on the run. Do you think we actually have the upper hand, even though they've got the bravado and the loud mouths? Absolutely, like 100%. Um, and you can see it in the little eco, uh, ecoclasm that is Speaker's Corner. You... You, you no longer have this eagerness to debate that used to be there maybe six or seven years ago. But it's completely gone, though. And I think what happened was they came up with a way of defending the theological more than the historical or more than the philosophical. So they were able to say things like, look, you don't know Arabic, so you can't talk about the Quran. And it's like, okay, well, that's a terrible argument, but at least it works for them. And then it kind of moved on. Hang on one second. <coughs> Forgive me, I still have a, a bit of a cough. Um, so they couldn't address anything else. When we talked about the history, when we were talking about Mecca, when we were talking about um, the fact that there was no reasonable way that Abraham could have traveled from where he was um, in Israel, down all the way down to, the Burak, to, uh, to Mecca. Chris, what do tiny you place. mean? That's why there's the Burak. <laughs> no, li literally, that, that actually <laughs> well, was. Yeah. No, literally... The, the idea of the Burak was invented Burak about a hundred years after the time of Muhammad. And it was in a poem, oddly enough, in a poem by a guy called, I think, called Ajaj. And he mentioned the Burak in a poem. But the, the idea of this Burak goes back to, shall we say, mystical um, ideas within um, sort of mystical, occultic ideas um, prior to, I mean, like long before, long before Islam. But the, the Burak is the reason. So the Burak is first applied to Abraham, taking him from Bethlehem to Mecca and back in a single day. That That's how they actually explain that. But it actually comes out of a poem first. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's, that's quite interesting. This, uh, I have learned something new today. I didn't realize they had uh, they had used the same thing for multiple <laughs> multiple. Yeah, so before the Burak idea was applied to Muhammad, it was first applied mm -hmm. to Abraham, but the idea was stolen. It was first found in an Islamic poem. And prior to that, though, it's part of the... It's part of the the Jewish occultic sort of um, the, the whole Merkava mysticism, that, that whole vibe. It's kind of hinted there, and so so that idea goes way back a couple of thousand years. But then the the Muslims solidify it and they they oh, capture wow. it and modify it for their own use in poetry. So I mean, poetry is not known for being, shall we say, hardcore scientific research, you know. No, it's it's not like the Quran, which is a, a clear. Uh, a scientific manual for, <laughs> for all generations to come. To follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, this, um, this so yeah, well. so we are, so we are having an effect. I mean, what what we're doing is having an effect. Well, what do you think is the strongest, the historical argument or the philosophical arguments? Because to be honest, I look at the philosophical stuff and I'm like, man, this just hurt my brain. So, but you know, the archaeology. So yeah. I, yeah, I mean, well, I, I think they're probably probably roughly the same because ultimately it leads to absurdum right it leads to islam is absurd you, you you're trying to tell me that there was this kaaba in the middle of nowhere that has no access to water that has no vegetation that, that has nothing anything like meaningful about it there's no sources to it there's no archaeology that supports it there's no was it 70 to 300 prophets buried underneath it there's there's nothing like this whatsoever and you're telling me that i should totally believe it and Every evidence points to the contrary that it came later. Every evidence, every reference, every inscription, everything. And yet you still 
telling me this. And he, when you get them to that point, they kind of have to admit, yeah, it's absurd, but it's what we believe. <laughs> Man, would be so, you know, if they <laughs> just me. dug up the body of Ishmael and his mother are supposed to be within three meters of the Kaaba. Within three meters, literally. Yeah. They claim. Right? How have they not done a little sonar scan around the Kaaba, found the bodies of Ishmael and his mom, and said, here you go, here's the evidence. Adam has a 36-meter skeleton, and he's supposed to be buried within 20 meters of the Kaaba. <laughs> Just dig it up, show it to us, and you guys are good. We will all say Shahada tomorrow if you just show us the Pikachu, right? Wouldn't you say so, Chris? All amazing. they got to do is show us the picture. Here it is. Here's Adam's skeleton. Don't you think? Yeah. 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 I mean, it would be, it'd be amazing. I mean, the, these things these things are just so... And you can tell, and that's a sad thing. When you talk to people about this, right? And I, I use the examples of, look, um, Allah will hear your prayer. Like in Christianity, when you pray to God, you pray to the Father, you pray to the Son. There is this understanding that this is more significant than earthly things, right? But for some reason in Islam, Allah will not accept your prayer. Say, say you're, say you're, um, you're, you're praying for a beloved one who's dying, something serious, or perhaps you're giving the the ultimate in thanks and devotion to to God. Allah will reject you because He saw the small parts of your back. And I've always thought this is just such a bizarre thing. The in in the religion they they have these rules that are not based in reason or logic or anything because I think ultimately Allah is not reason. He is not truth. He's he borrows from it if he wants to, and he rejects it if he wants to, and which I think is like the Al Ghazali view. But right, I th I think yeah, it's um, it's it doesn't make any rational sense. Why is it that you are prescribed how to go to the bathroom? Why is it you're prescribed how many stones to use to wipe your butt? Why are you prescribed? Because Muhammad, this is the this is the this. recipe for being the perfect man. Follow the recipe of Muhammad. Um, it's it's you know, fair say. In fact, thing, look, right? the, the modern Islamic scholars are really just the a continuation, an extreme an extreme sort of continuation of the Pharisaic idea of following this the ritual law or the customary law. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I could definitely see that. Um, you know, if you ask them, like, uh, is Muhammad the greatest moral example? Almost always they'll say yes. And they, and they know why they have to say yes. And they've been taught that it is. So that's fine. They'll say yes. And then you just bring up anything about this, this man's character. And then you could just see, like, you can see the cognitive di dissonance in their in their face. Right. They cannot accept what, what, what they have to think of here. It's like, look, he, he did absolutely appalling things. <laughs> And yeah, they they won't um, they won't know how to process it, and and you can hear all sorts of excuses. Actually, I'm going to bring up really sad. Yeah, on that point, I'm going to bring up something in a minute uh, on that. But question number five, um, we've kind of touched on that already. So um, so the polemics landscapes is changing. You've mentioned so we are having an effect, and they seem to be floundering. Yeah, I, I just want to finish that off by saying we absolutely are. It's it's amazing to see this this the work that you've been doing, uh, Thaddeus, uh, Mel, uh, Jay, all these guys and, and many more. What they have produced and what they have put out there is material that the layman, which is very much like me, I'm, I am just a layman. I'm you know I'm learning all this stuff from from scratch. It's it's useful for us to take directly into the lion's den, so to speak. Or maybe not a lion, but you know the, <laughs> there's a den of something there, and to and to give this out and. The reaction you'll see is they don't know how to solve it. Uh, your connection. They don't know how to deal with Sorry, it. Sorry, you just had a bit of a connection issue. You're back. You are back. Oh, am I back? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Can you hear me all right? Yes, got you. You know, your audio stayed, just your okay. video froze for a moment. Ah, okay, okay, fine. Nice. Um, but yeah, so absolutely, we are having a huge impact. That's good to know. Thank you. I mean, th this is why it's also good to speak to you because you are there on the ground. Um, number six, where should we focus our attention? Um, continue with a historical critique. I think there is um, there's fruit to be found there. There are definitely things that we have not yet found, we have not yet put together. What I'm looking for, and I think this is probably what we're all looking for regarding the historical narrative, which is a complete narrative that opposes the sin, in other words, it's no longer the case that we're saying the sin is wrong, 
here's all the reasons why it's obviously wrong, but rather here's what actually is the case. And here is how we build that up using evidence. Here's how we, we, we take this more into the mainstream. We basically say, look, here's the, the, the oh, not even like a skeptics version in the sense, but rather just a, a honest, uh, contemporary, evidence-based view. And I think when we have that, we'll, we'll be sitting on a gold mine. And I think well, um, that, yeah. Things are changing. Look, Jay is the guy, I think, that, that created this, Jay's the guy that, that that kind of opened the door, right? And and made people feel free to question, to to realize, hold on, that there there is something here that needs to be investigated. And three years ago, I mean Thaddeus is a is a witness to this as well, but people didn't believe me three years ago. They're like, This Sharia, what nonsense is that? Lloyd, 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 the Quran says, Lloyd, the Quran says. And I'm like, I don't care what the Quran says. I, I really have very little interest in that book. Now, people actually listen to me. People actually use my material. When three years ago, I was on the, I was on the fringes. I was a crazy man, you know. Um, Mal is is coming up with some. He's got something that I think Mal may have hit on the original source of the of the myth that built around Muhammad. I think he's a composite of multiple different characters, maybe genuine historical characters, but merged but mal may have now found the original source of that of that of that narrative in islam i think he may have um, mal may be onto something i've just discovered something after discussing with mal that for instance the dome of the rock is is modeled after fourth and fifth century byzantine church designs the dome interesting of, yeah the dome of the rock that that octagonal shape is not an Islamic shape. It's unlike any other Islamic mosque. But there is a... Hold on, actually. Hold on, hang on, hang on. Uh, let me bring this up. Uh, wait, let me do a couple of things before I get too far away. But um, uh, this, if you can see here, um, this is the summary of the unsheathed sword against the one who insults the messenger. I'll leave it on a moment on the screen so it'll catch up with you. Actually, you know what? I, I'm going to share my screen. I, you know what, Chris? I should have done. I'm so sorry. I, I keep forgetting to do this. I should just share my screen with you so you can see exactly. You should be able to see that. Yeah, yeah sounds good, Joe. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking at then it. Then you can uh, see this in real time. This is a, yeah. yeah, this is a, uh, what you call it, a book all about peace, right? Yes, correct. Now, you can <laughs> see here, it says, whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether they are Muslim or a disbeliever. Right? Insulting the prophet yeah. literally means, now, Insulting the Prophet technically just refers to someone who does not believe that Muhammad is perfect. So wow. any deviation from the idea that Muhammad is perfect is insulting Muhammad. And killing is prescribed on him, the one who insults the Prophet, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or ransom him. Now, of course, within the Sharia, if they cannot go to the full extent of the law, they need to go as far as they can. Right? They've got these multiple gradations. There are always laws that modify things. But this is why Muslims cannot speak ill of Muhammad or Islam, because it is illegal. Any Muslim or non-Muslim who insults the Prophet is to be killed and repentance is not sought. Under the full Sharia, this will be the law. ISIS implemented this fully. The Taliban implements this. But, of course, Muslims don't have yet full political control of, of, of let's say, Britain, so therefore they can't yet implement this. But... But this is the, the penalty imposed upon them, and they discuss it at length within their book. You can see this work is to clarify the Islamic ruling upon the subject, and they are to be killed even if they are a dhimmi. See? So they're to be killed, and it goes on at length. And you can, I'll just do, I mean, this is page after page of the same thing. You haven't seen the word killing used so often as in this book. So this is one of these books that I uh, I've been meaning to do a, a deep dive into. Yeah, so because uh, you'd be surprised, people at the corner often reject this. Anything from Ibn Taymiyyah um, or Ibn Ibn Ki Ibn, I can't Ibn Qayyim. The guy. Ibn Qayyim. But the, as That's I said, that they yeah. will they will throw. Look, I mean, Daif Bukhari, Daif Muslim, they will show, throw <laughs> everything under the bus because it's embarrassing, even if true. The yeah. fact is, it's slander. Slander in Islam is is something that is true but embarrassing. Whereas in, whereas in Western law, slander is a false smear upon you that causes you harm. 
Whereas in Islam, slander is something that is true <clears throat> that causes embarrassment. So Wow. That's a huge, huge like cavern of distance there between those two schools of the law. Yeah, you know. So um what were you you were gonna say something and then I was gonna oh I was gonna bring up something in um not this one. Uh while we're here, maybe you can tell us a bit more. Is there anything on point six that, that you want to mention? Or maybe number seven, up to you, uh, which you'd like to go on while I look for some, some material? Uh, to, 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 to. Oh, yeah, maybe number seven. What are our strongest arguments? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think for the DCCI, the work that they've done with the multiple Qurans is absolutely devastating. Mm -hmm. um, really amazing stuff there. Being able to demonstrate that there are differences in different Arabic Qurans absolutely really hurts, really hurts them. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the reasons why the debate I had with the Bas was just so effective because there are so many people that haven't heard this stuff. They they are encouraged to only go so deep and do not go deeper. Do not cross that line. You know, um, there are different recitations diff which are just different dialects. Don't think anything more of it other than that. That's the prescribed Islamic view that right. they tell people at the corner. But it's great because you get to you get to just blow that out of the water. And there's some books, um, something that I read from because I have it on my phone. And I would recommend anyone who wants to have a very quick and easy way of showing this to be false is to get a book called The Ten Kilat of the Noble Quran by uh, Dr. Fidel Soliman of the Bridges Foundation. This book is by an honest person who has studied Arabic, who knows Arabic, who has a team of experts. They've tr uh, they've translated the Quran. What was his name, please? Just so that I can... Kilat. What was his name, please? Sure. Uh, Dr. Fadel Soliman. Fadel Soliman. Okay, I hope I'm spelling it right in the chat. Just to have a record of uh, it. But thank you. I believe that's correct, yeah. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find the Bridges um, Foundation, and then you can find the things that they, they distribute, and one of them is their own book the tanker out of the noble quran and yeah he he openly says and there was little footnotes and you can tap on it whenever there's a a, a difference in the quran over a verse and he actually ha he has the text in red so you can be like oh there's a difference here and if you just look at surah fatiha where it comes to uh the word master it will be in red and you can look at the oh. the uh, footnote for it and it will say oh well actually this person's quran says this this person's quran says this and it's like oh wow you can you can tell where the variants are. Awesome. And what was it? So book, wait, it's Fadl Soliman. Let me just type yep. it in for you. And the, the name of the book, please, again, or the name of the group where you can find it. <clears throat> so let me just, uh, I'll touch on myself yeah. as well. And uh, Mal is in the channel. Ads. Welcome, Islamic Origins. So Thaddeus and Islamic Origins, thank you, guys. Good to see you. So so really, really grateful oh, to have nice. you guys we have here. A, we have a team here. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Um, so Mal, we've been speaking about you, um, you know, that... And Chris has been saying good, good things about the work you're doing. And yeah, this is great. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just, Mel, I was just telling everyone that I think that you you are probably hitting on um, the source of the, 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 the Muhammad story, the Muhammad character, you know, that I think that you're finding the source that they modified to use as a foundational idea for Muhammad. I, th I think there's something there. I think I get that feeling, you know, that something's happening. So Chris, uh, back to you. It's exciting stuff. Um, I have a link to the website. Uh, if I can, I share that in the chat. Maybe? Yeah, you should be able so to. I don't restrict the chat that way, so it should work. Okay, so should I just post the link in the chat? Um, so you can look at that book, and it's just a really amazing tool to quickly show people the different variants in the Arabic Qurans. And the actual introduction of the book, uh, Fadel Soliman himself says that in the Qur'at, about 30% of it is, difference, is uh, differences in meaning. In other words, they're not dialects, they're not meaning. different uses of tense. It's actual, uh, they change the meaning of the verse. 30%. Wow. So wait, what's the and name of the book? I've Tell me again, just so I have it for that. the audience here. Oh. Yes, <laughs> actually, it's called The Bridges Translation of the Ten Qur'at of the Noble Qur'an. Okay, The Bridges Translation of the Ten... Ten I can post it by the way if you want. of the Quran. I'm just typing it into the um, into the window here so everyone can see it. Fadl Soliman, the Bridges translation of the Ten Kiraat of the Quran. So something of that type. No, so close enough. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Fadl so oh Bridges Okay, Thomas Mitchell also just posted it. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, Thomas Mitchell just posted nice. the name there as well. So excellent. Thanks. This is brilliant. So actually, so meaning. So this this goes. So this again violates the Islamic narrative, the standard narrative. Yeah, and this is the thing, right? Like um, most most people, most IEs are told they can't talk about this. Oh, only mods can post them. links. I'm gonna have to make you a mod, Chris. <laughs> I just got oh. <laughs> told only mods can post links. I'll have to make you a mod. Uh, oh, what is your well, Chris? What is you what want. is your YouTube name? Uh, Chris at Speakers Corner. Uh, my oh the the handle. Yeah. Oh. Unless you just type just type oh. a regular comment and I will I will find it. Hi. There we go. Oh, uh, reasoned also put the link in. Thank you. So yeah, reasoned just. Oh, I'll, I'll make you a mod. May as well just. Uh, Excellent, thanks. Yeah, so so uh, Thaddeus Reason Dancers just put the link to the Amazon version of it. That is awesome. I'm gonna have to look at this. Thank you. That is really. I mean, guys, this is a fascinating conversation. I mean, to to learn this kind of information from someone who's on the ground dealing with this, this is brilliant. Um, so nice. Yeah, I've never heard any response to this, by the way. Oh, actually, no. The only response is, um, I don't trust Dr. Fadal Soleiman. <laughs> uh you know it's it's the same thing they you know you can tell them look he's an expert he has a team of uh that he actually says who the team are in his book they know arabic they've translated the kurla art he's a specialist in the kurla art he has his own foundation to dawa that's set up in in egypt in cairo and they'll be like i i don't care you know <laughs> that's the only response they have right yeah right um yeah. So, 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 what are our strongest arguments? So, so th to just just to recap that, what what are our strongest arguments? I guess the historical argument is very powerful. It's got them on the run. Anything else from from? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, the there is not just one Quran. There are many, and also, I I do like philosophy. I have to be honest. It's um, something I I do enjoy. So, in my own faith, I can look at philosophy and I can know how this is a useful tool you could perhaps say that philosophy is the handmaiden of theology in the christian faith but in islam they can't have that perspective they in fact there are actually people who are salafi at speaker's corner and they uh, for example um what's his name um his name will come to me but there's a particular person who goes there who's very popular he gets lots of people around and he you know they listen to the speaks he uh, to, uh, talks he gives and he openly says look you can't use this kind of philosophy you can't use this kalam you can't have this uh, scholastic theology you have to abandon it and the reason why is because the sahaba didn't use this stuff it's not found in the quran it's not found in the sunnah so don't use it so you can ask them philosophical questions like how is allah above his throne and also in the lowest heaven at the same time which is a serious theological problem for uh, philosophical and theological problem for them and I can't give you an answer to this. In fact, you can find YouTube videos where Dais are trying to address this, and ultimately they say, Bilaki, uh, Bilak Kaif, Bilak, uh, however they, you pronounce it in Arabic, only Allah knows. Don't ask questions. This is beyond ah. us. There are things about the faith you just have to accept. That is, th that's is in the Sharia as well. That, that quite literally is stated. There's a chapter, section A1.4 talks about that. Have a look at what I have here on the screen, Chris. Just have a look at this. Unlawful knowledge includes. Learning sorcery. Since according to the most reliable position, it is unlawful, as the vast majority of scholars have decisively stated, philosophy, magic, meaning sleight of hand, astrology. No, notice that unlawful knowledge includes sorcery, mm. philosophy, and magic. Philosophy is sandwiched yeah. between magic and sorcery. It's yeah. unlawful yeah, for Muslims is, um, to learn philosophy. It's sand, it's it's considered in the same league the... as sorcery. Wow. This is just crazy. Like when I think about this stuff, I think about the, the damage it's done, right? Like imagine I mean from from my point of view, the way that you see Muslim cultures now, you see Islamic cultures, they just don't contribute to the academic world in anywhere near the same scope as European countries, as Western, North American, South American nations, it, like, and the East as well. Um, you just don't see that same level of academic output. And I think genuinely one reason for that is because their traditions stop them from doing it. And their traditions are rooted in these ideas. And they haven't figured out a way of getting around this. 
it's the same um uh ashari akida mm-hmm. it's the same theological standpoint they just can't get out of yeah dude that they've got issues um I mean, there are some serious issues, but do, um, what are their weakest arguments? In, in so counterpoint to number seven, <laughs> their weakest, yeah, their weakest arguments. They have a lot of very weak arguments, um, and you can watch. You can uh, watch pause the just one moment. So, sorry to interrupt. Villains yeah. just made a very interesting point. He said, "Notice that the banned form of magic is the sleight of hand, the press the digitation, not the real magic they actually practice, like the evil eye, etc." So you said that notice that the kind of magic that is banned is sleight of hand. But I guess the rest would fall under sorcery. But this means probably sorcery is maybe banned for for laymen. No, but but very interesting. So yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make that point. Uh, sorry, so back back to their weakest arguments. So um yeah, you can see you can see what they, they produce in their videos when they get um people who don't know things. <clears throat> um they their their weakest arguments are things like uh, well it it depends on your perspective right if you're talking about just Islamic arguments for their own faith then it's the, then their weakest arguments are their their liars um, it's things like Muhammad is a feminist Muhammad was a lovely person Muhammad did lots of great things he was a civil rights campaigner somehow <gasps> um, um, there is, <laughs> uh, the Quran is perfect um, there is not a single error in the Quran at all. There is only one Quran. Allah is Tahir, and Tahir means one, which we know that it doesn't. As you pointed out, Tahir means more closer to unity. Mm-hmm. It does not mean the monad that they they uh, they wish that it did. Um, pe- people living in the Islamic society are somehow uh, The naturalist just mentioned the queen of the UK is a descendant of Momo. The queen was a Muslim too. I've heard people say this. <laughs> Uh, there's a particular person at Speaker's Corner who says this. Um, I wonder if it might be him. I'm not sure. <laughs> no. But yeah, there's, there's some strange claims people make. Have you heard um, Have you heard the claim that uh, Muhammad is a relative of Jesus? Have you heard that one? No. It's something like he's... Yeah, yeah. I've actually heard... I mean, they're considered a fringe at Speaker's Corner, but there are some Muslims that would try and tell you this. Yeah. No. <laughs> People asking about Thunderous One. His channel was removed by YouTube. YouTube actually deleted the entire channel. He may have started a second one, um, but I'm not sure if it's taken off. Um, so yeah, but it, so Thunderous has gone quiet for a while. I should actually get back in touch with them, just just to answer questions in the in the chat. Um, oh, just to jump in yeah. as well, I've, I've said something. Uh, the Great Commission. Uh, one of their weakest arguments is Muhammad is in Isaiah 42, yes. and I, I completely agree with that. They, well, actually, it's, it's also just Isaiah. Uh, Muhammad is anywhere. Um, one of the things you'll realize very quickly is they don't know what the Torah is. So, for example, they'll say Muhammad is in the in the Torah. He's in Isaiah 42. And you're like, that's that's not the Torah. <laughs> so, <laughs> first of all, there's a there's a big problem there. But anyway, um, ignoring that fact, they they bring this up basically because of places that I mentioned. Uh, Sailor and um, I can't remember what the, what the other one is, but it means the it's basically North North Arabia. But they like to think that it's a reference to a place uh, in the Hejaz, mm-hmm. but it isn't at all. And they ignore all the other geolog- uh, geological references. So, if, for example, it talks about the islands. It talks about the, the coastlands. It talks about obvious geographical places, that mean it's establishing like a, a range. It's basically saying people will, will will sing out with joy in this range of geographical places. It's not saying a singular place. Um, and of course, the name Muhammad isn't explicitly mentioned. And of course, you would have to say lots of things about the servant being things that Muhammad isn't. And um, there is that notorious example of, a, I think it's like a merciful servant, the YouTube mm-hmm. channel, the Muslim YouTube channel. They made a video about this where they accidentally claimed that Muhammad was Yahweh. Yes, yes, and, and, yes. And it was, it was, yeah. Yes, I remember I that. Saw that. Yes, well. I, I think they still actually have it published as well. They haven't taken it Correct. down. But the comments are just filled with, you know, look, stop saying that Yahweh is Muhammad or Muhammad is Yahweh. You, you can't do that. You have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. Um, so there were a little bit of shirk committed by 
uh, merciful servant, but you know. <laughs> yeah. oh, Do well. you think that our argumentation um, is having an effect on the wider lay community that our arguments are getting out there, that our arguments are being heard and because I'm, I do see yes, them retreating. Yes, I mean, are. I said, no one wants to. Jay, I think, is probably not having an easy time finding people willing to sit down and debate with him. I cannot find someone who's willing to break open the Sharia and have them, have them show me exactly how I'm making a mistake. Right? That's just not happening. Right? They'll, they'll make all sorts of claims, but they will not step up and prove it. Um, so do you think, so on that yeah. point, what's your thoughts? So? I, I think that's exactly right. I think what you're seeing is, um, I think there's kind of like a, um, I'm trying to think of the right term for this. Maybe it's maybe not completely organized, but there's organization involved where they are getting together and they are saying, look, don't talk to this person. Don't engage on this argument. Don't engage We've on seen this, this point. Yes. If someone says this, then, then, you know, um, then just, oh yeah, I've, I've seen all, well, I, I see the results of it. And I see people trying to take people away from others. That's another thing they do. Uh, at Speaker's Corner, if you try and have a conversation with a Muslim who's like a visitor, this Muslim has turned up, you know, he's he's being friendly, he's being polite, you're having a discussion about something, you're listening to what he says, he's listening to what you say, especially if they're a woman, especially if they're female. There will be Muslims who will come in and sweep them away. And it's kind of amazing. Literally, they will just use foot, like literally just usher them away. Like, don't speak to this person. And they'll tell them, this is a person who's a Christian. Um, he's a bad person. Don't speak to him. Um, only speak to Muslims or only speak to these Da'is. Do not engage with these people. <laughs> and it's like, wow. You know, we, we've caught it on camera so many times. Um, there's a channel that I'm just going to recommend because it has some of this footage. If you guys check out um, Revelation 22.13, uh, he has some great footage of, of quite recently, actually, uh, a Muslim coming along and on multiple occasions in the same day, taking different different uh, uh, Muslims away from Christians because he doesn't want them. You, you can bring it up. It is. I'm showing it right it's now. Interesting. If you go to videos, um, if you click on the videos thing. There, yeah, got it. Oh, if you're just showing the channel, that's fine. Yeah, don't, don't worry yeah. about it. But um, there you go. You can see the. <laughs> it's the second, on the ro second row down, the second one in. That's a, that's a video where a Muslim comes and takes a, a Muslim lady away. Yeah. Because the Christian was too scary. <laughs> wow. So they've really ceded, they've ceded the ground to us. I mean, but the thing is that they've increased the volume. Even if they haven't sort of upped their game, they've just gotten louder. And in fact, I mean, as someone mentioned yep. earlier, they've literally just outright resorted to trolling now. They are literally just there to troll. And they admit it as well. Yeah, there is there is a large element of this in Speaker's Corner. There are actually trolls there, like uh, Muslim trolls who are there because they can't win arguments. So they're there kind of to, promote, to, to give backup. They're there to heckle, to make jokes, and to not seriously engage. There was this guy... Um, I was having a conversation with him and I showed him from multiple sources, right? From tafsir, from sh different uh, Sharia manuals. Um, all of the interpretations of Surah Al-Talaq Ayah 4, which is Surah 65 Ayah 4. And that's the, the, that's the Ayah in which it says that the Ida, the waiting period, is three months for someone of whom has not menstruated. Mm -hmm. And I was I was showing them, and it it, get, it gets like kind of disgusting, uh, like at times, because it's just all of these scholars of Islam, these heavyweights of Islam, saying, "Yeah, this is referring to those who are too young to have started." Yeah, they said cycle. openly, correct? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and when you look at um, is it Maududi? I think his name is like he he's a fairly modern-ish Pakistani scholar, and he gave, he did his own tafsir of the Quran, and he's like, "Look, guys, I know this might not be popular now, but we cannot deny what the Quran says." And it's like, wow. So not only do you have historical um, accounts from really well-respected Muslims, you have modern accounts in the modern era. I think this was like from the 80s, where you have these incredibly works of <clears> Islam <throat> saying, don't be ashamed by this. This is what it is. Yeah. Well, look at this. This is the 2002. This is 30th of June, 2002. This is fatwa number I searched, literally, I searched for Islam QA plus 22442. I remember the number. This is the Fatwa number. That's all I searched for on Google, on any search engine. And it comes up on acting and the ruling on marrying young girls. And the guy asks, 
Why are you allowed to marry girls below the age of 10 without permission? Can you justify this ruling? And they state here, marrying a young girl before she reaches the age of adolescence is permitted in the Sharia. It was narrated that there was scholarly consensus, the Ijma on this point. This is Islam QA is the largest fatwa or Islamic advice site on earth. They get between 150 up to, the, this was when I checked like four years ago when I had access to the data. I no longer do. But then they were getting from 150 to 400 million visits per month. Right? And they say here that this verse, 65.4, a girl who does not have periods because she's young and has not yet reached puberty. This indicates that Allah has made this a valid marriage. They openly state it. And they state here that, um, right, there's nothing in the Hadith of Aisha to set an age limit or to forbid that in the case of a girl who is able for it before the age of nine. They make it, this is this is Ooh. public. This is public. I'm not, this is not an archive. This is right now. And they are saying this. So I don't know. This is, this is bluntly stated on Islam QA. Just scroll up a little bit. <clears throat> that, that red part there. Uh, Abu Ubayyid said that once a girl reaches the age of nine, then the marriage may be consummated even without her consent. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, this section here. It's horrifying. Yeah. <coughs> but notice it says, but that does not apply in the case of who is younger. And then they contradict themselves right here. In the Sharia, yeah. when you read the Sharia, they'll say a law that says don't eat chocolate chip cookies because chocolate chip cookies are the, are the tool of Satan. And then one paragraph down, you'll say chocolate chip cookies are awesome. You should bake them every Sunday. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just crazy how they literally one sentence to the next contradict a law they just passed in the Enough. sentence <clears throat> above. It's insane. <clears throat> it is. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then, okay, question number nine, please. And ten. Let's have a look. <laughs> do you represent the Judean People's Front or the People's Front of Judea? <clears throat> I represent both equally. <laughs> <laughs> so we should we should be ecumenical, um, you're saying? <laughs> yes, be ecumenical in regards to the People's Front of Judea or the Judean People's Front. And the Front of the People of Judea, <laughs> should we form a third organization and just call it the Front of the People of Judea to create a unity? I think so. I, I definitely think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, for, for the audience what do you guys think are you guys for the Judean People's Front the JPF or the PFJ and or should we start the FPJ instead so uh, just 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 want you guys to just just let us know in the comments thank you in the chat uh, yeah the, so a reason says they give multiple opinions and say the last one no age limit is the correct one uh, Marcus Schmidt says the PFJ it rolls off the tongue easier. The People's Front of Judea. So the people oh. have spoken. <laughs> now we know. Now we know. Uh, Protestant believer is in the chat for those who were looking for him earlier. He's there now. More like a Quran tradition. Yes. So he's. <laughs> <laughs> what are your Judean pronouns? <laughs> <laughs> Ken, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think oh, I'm for the man. JPF. I don't know. We need to. We need to check with the. Uh, we're gonna have to ask the guys. <clears throat> we're gonna have to check the Python for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So. So yeah. Okay. So so we were getting somewhere with this one. So, uh, uh, Chris. Oddly enough, Chris has not seen the life of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so so was, as, as part of your uh, as part of your ecumenical training chris we're gonna have to get you to uh you know could do some some proper Watch hikmah on Brian. this one you know what I, th I thought i had heard like all the references from it as well i i uh, but i've not heard that one so that's that's completely completely skipped me <clears throat> yeah yeah uh, okay so we've got so i've got here um number 11 Why have all the trained scholars stepped off the stage and left amateurs behind to defend Islam? <laughs> it's it's like the whole um, uh, what was it? You get the the people at the front who you know are going to die in the, in the in the battlefield when you have like a line of soldiers. Cannon fodder. All the people at the front, yeah, cannon fodder, right? <laughs> it's like I will gladly make that sacrifice for the good of Islam. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
And I, I think that is it, right? I think that that is the point. Um, <clears throat> the, they, the, 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 the scholars. I mean, I, I don't even know how how people would would even be a scholar in today's age of Islam because there's there's so much contention. You're stuck between being anti anti science, anti reason, anti logic, in order to affirm a theological position that. In all honesty, there is a growing, growing movement within Islam to oppose because they're desperately trying to, like, uh, modernize and and get out of this. But the 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 Salafists, the Wahhabis, they they keep pulling them back in and saying, no, you need to affirm this. You know, it's not Daif Buh- uh, Buh- uh, Bukhari, it's uh, Sahih Bukhari. But it's it's an impossible thing. You can't win. You're stuck between two extremes, and. For that reason, you know, there's more and more people at Speaker's Corner that are heretical, heretical Islam. Right. And, you know, they'll say, like, I'm a Muslim, I believe in Muhammad. And you're, oh, okay, so what do you think about uh, when Muhammad did this according to Sahih Bukhari? And they go, I don't believe anything that comes out of that man's mouth. You know, sometimes I think these people are just <laughs> lying to distract. Just a couple of points. The Great Commission says, Chris at Speaker's Corner, brother, I'll see you soon at the park. Let's go for fish and chips afterwards. Um,. I'd love that. And love that then um, Villain says, yeah. what sort of Brit is Chris if he hasn't seen the life of Brian? And then we've got Ordinary <laughs> Bloke who says, strict Brianism or bust. So, <laughs> so guys, yeah. Is, do you think strict Brianism is a heresy or do you think that is orthodoxy? Uh, just drop your comments in the chat. Strict Brianism or not? So, Chris, strict Brianism or uh, or do we need to to, to have a well, you know a bit more open approach here? Uh, maybe maybe a bit of both. Um, <laughs> okay, fine. I'll take the Islamic perspective and say both at the same time, depending on who asks. <laughs> and uh, we'll have levels of knowledge to this. So there will some that will only know a little bit about Brian, and then there will be some <laughs> that know more and more. And um, eventually, they'll have complete uh, Gnostic understanding of the life of Brian uh, to its fullest. I think Brian is a way for us to start over. You know, we can start fresh. You know, and do it right this time. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, so on that, um, does Brian have two right hands and a shin? Very naughty boy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you. Someone just mentioned that the that the amateurs have a larger following on YouTube than the actual scholars. The actual the the amateurs. Do you think the amateurs are fronting for a scholar, or do you think the amateurs are? I think so. <clears throat> um, I think I think they're filling a, a gap, right? I don't think scholars can give you that kind of um well-rounded reasonable faith which is ironic right like um we have scholars like william lane craig who actually you know they have their own website reasonable faith but they they actually give a philosophical de- like uh defense of the position of christianity mm-hmm. but they can't from theirs and you know what's interesting i did some research a while ago so if you look at the most commonly um commonly referenced and looked up uh, I want to say scholar, but I'm using that in a very loose term. For Islam, you don't find people like, I don't know, uh, Shabir Ali or Yasser Qadi or things like that. You find Zakir Naik by an overwhelming majority. And I'm talking like like 10 to 1 level. In other words, when you want to know about Islam from the, the big guys, the, the intellectuals, it's a guy who doesn't speak Arabic, who doesn't doesn't have any kind of qualifications to talk about this, who is the main person that most Muslims go to. And I find that just really sad. Just really sad. There's, there's, yeah, the scholars are not allowed to cause doubt. They, one of their, one of their, one of their functions, I guess there's a term is to, is to avoid the creation of doubt. So I think they kind of just, they, they just kind of, whatever keeps the peace is good. And if they give a true answer, they're going to create friction. I suspect. Yeah, I I think it is that. Um, I think these people like Ahmed Dida and Zakir Naik, they they aren't scholars at all, but they they have that that they will be considered scholars by many of the Ummah because they are the most popular people. <laughs> so you know when they want answers, if a Christian comes up to them and asks them a difficult question, they're going to go to Zakir Naik of all people. <laughs> Yeah, but he hasn't, um, hasn't he kind of disappeared or gone quiet? I think he's wanted for crimes, you know. A couple of them, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. So I think that's why he doesn't he doesn't appear much. Um, I can't remember if he's not allowed in Pakistan anymore or something. I think so. There's somewhere he's not allowed to enter, um, which is kind of humorous in and of itself. But 
yeah, they don't have any scholars that they can bring up that can can adequately fill in this gap. This is why, um, like Yasakadi, he might have been one, but now he's been completely thrown under the bus because he he told the truth. He you know he did the famous interview with mm-hmm. Mohammed Hijab where he said, look, was it? Uh, he said, uh, look, uh, look, Aki, don't 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 ask these kind of questions. Uh, it's dangerous for the Ummah. They they can't know this kind of thing. If you want to know, uh, pay for my course, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll tell you the answer. Um, which is which is sad, you know. They 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 don't have anyone who can help them. They have to borrow. They have to abandon. They have to say one thing and then say another thing, depending on who they're speaking to. And that's what happens, you know. Um, if you're defending an obvious, in in my opinion, I think there is cultish behaviors to Islam. I, I think you can definitely have a understanding of a cult that incorporates Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, and at which point, yeah, that's that's classic behavior. You can't defend against uh, reason, so you abandon reason and you adopt deceitful behaviors to compensate. Yeah, that, that's within the Sharia. I can actually dive into the notes. I mean, I, I'm trying not to do so too much to distract from, from your message, but I mean, it would be great if we can pick this up again at some point and expand on some of these and try to align it to stuff in the Sharia, which which then explains the behaviors, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that'd be, that'd be really interesting. And it'd be a good learning uh, opportunity for me to to see how that kind of all comes together yeah. because I'm just I'm still putting together a lot of parts. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's interesting for me as well. I'm mean, just to listen and the audience. I mean, look, also I'm trying to read the audience stuff, so I, I I'm not always able to like focus completely. But it's for me and for the audience. But also I'm trying to juggle. I don't have a producer sitting in the background, you know. So because uh, it's <laughs> the team is is me. So, uh, but but I mean, this is interesting. You are the producer. Sorry? You are the producer, right? I am. You have to do the all of the jobs. Yeah, and I'm trying to keep track of the chat as well. And um, but but from from the audience, what are you guys taking away from this? I mean, uh, Thaddeus uh, Mal, what are you guys taking away from this? What are the big points that you are realizing here? Because I mean, this <clears throat> this is actually really you know in a way inspirational, knowing from someone on the ground that <clears throat> that we are having a genuine impact, that he's seeing them retreat. I mean, would you say they are retreating from us? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I actually have an issue now uh, in my own ministry, which is if I want to debate a Muslim da'i, um, they reject me immediately. They they get to the point now where if they see me coming, they'll move out the way, or they will, um, yeah, just immediately start throwing character assaults at me. Basically, right? Which are they supposed they, to do? Which know, is escalating to person. to send you with harsh language? Yeah. What do you think is the long term yeah, effect yeah, of this? Maybe. What do you think is the is, is long term the effect of this? The long-term effect is that they will, well, I think if nothing changes for them, they're eventually going to have to softly abandon Speaker's Corner as a strategic point <clears throat> because this is a spiritual war. Like, I, I want to make that clear that that is what happens at Speaker's Corner. And if you're not emotionally and spiritually prepared for it, I would, I would very much ask that you, perhaps you don't you don't turn up there. But if you are, then it'd be good to have you there. If they can't deal with this and they don't have answers to it. They have to leave. They, they have to get out of there because at the moment they have the numbers, right? There are quite a few Muslims at Speaker's Corner. We're probably outnumbered three or four to one. Right. Maybe, maybe about that range. But if you are in a position where the people there are learned Christians who know the stuff, who can attack Islam and do it effectively, how do you stop these Muslims coming who don't know how to defend it from being exposed to this information? And the answer is, well, tell them not to come. The answer is, don't go to Speaker's Corner for that purpose. <clears throat> um, you can't evangelize or give dawah at Speaker's Corner if there's too much of a risk of, a, of someone coming in and just saying, oh, actually, what that guy said to you was a lie. Like, you know, he's, he's literally just lied to you about his own faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I, so last week I had a little bit of this where I had a dialogue with a guy who was talking to a Christian and I just simply, I, I challenged some of the things he was saying about Christianity, right? He was saying, um, you can't trust the gospels, they're not reliable, you don't know who wrote the gospels, these, this kind of attack. And I threw it back at him and I said, look, I want you to tell me exactly who wrote this particular book. I want you to tell me to write Surah Al-Baqarah. Who was the very first person who wrote it? Because the book in and of itself doesn't identify who wrote it which is the claim that they make about the Gospels. Couldn't answer me at all. Mm-hmm. That's actually and a brilliant the, question. The I've never Christian thought to ask that, and that's actually, that is genius. 
I, I like it. Yeah, I've never heard a response to it. Well, they, they, they've given kind of soft responses, but the brilliant thing about it is when they give you a response, it actually just leads to more questions. Mm -hmm. so, so someone once said to me, okay, uh, Zayed bin Tabit. Zayed bin Tabit wrote it. And I'll say, first of all, show me that. But second of all, Zayed bin Tabit may have recorded it, but Uthman was the one who then standardized the things that he wrote. So in other words, no, he didn't write it. He had a copy editor. He had someone who took this work that he got from someone else or that he found on a stone or a piece of leaf, according to the Hadith. Right. He, Uthman then changed it into what he wanted it to be. So he wasn't the, the sort of final author. There was a, someone after him who acted as a copy editor. And that, of course, leads into, well, how do you know it's reliable if it's been edited by another person, by a third party? And then, of course, you lead on to, well, the crime can't be perfectly preserved if it has a copy editor. Who wow. Isn't Man, this is genius. Wow. That is, that is hard hitting. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I like this. <laughs> I, this is a good, a good way to, to respond to things like this. No, that is um, turning the tables. That, answer, is, that is so. using that argument on them and finding that they have no leg to stand on either. Absolutely. And one of the things I was saying to this guy was, look, you're not acting like a Muslim because you're not following Islam. The arguments you're making are actually against Islam. You just haven't realized it yet. Oh, actually, I think I think this guy knows. I think he's just being disingenuous. Wow. But the point is, um, <clears throat> you cannot have these questions about authorship, about the Gospels, saying that we don't know who wrote them when we do. But they'll say, ah, but they're formally anonymous. In the actual works themselves, they don't announce who is writing it. Fine, but the Quran in and of itself doesn't have any book in which it says, by the way, the person who's saying these things or writing these things is this person. You won't find that in any surah. Yeah. Whereas you will find it in some books of the Bible. So some books aren't formally anonymous. Some of them actually tell you who the author is. But in the Quran, it won't tell you anywhere. Wow. The naturalist so says this is gold. Is, yeah. uh, I agree. <clears throat> Yeah, it's, 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 it's powerful stuff. And I think one of the things we have to do as, as rhetoric is to actually learn these things, just say them immediately. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone tries to say, the Gospels are unreliable because we don't know the authors, just jump in with this immediately and say, if you go with that line of argument, you have to give up being a Muslim. You, you just have to give it up because the position you're in is a thousand times worse than anything that we could ever be in. Wow. You know, this is something worth exploring, actually discussing your, your, your polemical rebuttals and um, your apology. This is actually worth actually doing a talk about taking some of the big questions that, for instance, I've got an audience that, 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 that has to deal with this in the comments, right? Maybe, maybe not face to face like you, which means, I mean, you've, you've battle tested these, these responses. You've been in the thick of it. But I mean, you can obviously educate people on, on, some, on some very, very good apologetics and polemics here and arguments. But this is fantastic. Um, I have like a final question, and there's one question from an audience member that came in earlier. Um, <clears throat> uh, but just maybe, have you ever been threatened at Speaker's Corner? Maybe just tackle this one first, this audience question here. Um, sure. So the answer is yes. Um, so not, not, in a, not in a way that I, I feel is particularly... Actually, there's a few things to say about this. First of all, yes, I had a debate with Shamsi, that's his name, from earlier, um, and it was the first debate I ever had with him. And he came in, he didn't know who, who I was. He hadn't heard the things that I've said or the things that I know. He didn't know anything like this. So he came to me in the evening cause it was dark now. This is winter. So it was about five or six o'clock, but it was pitch black and it's a dangerous time to be at the corner when it's dark, by the way. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, because there's, there tends to be less cameras. There's obviously less light, so it's easier to do things unnoticed. So they, so they um, will use violence if they can. If they can, yeah. And what's interesting is I think a lot of it is actually just emotional uh, instability. So, so what kind of happens is you'll notice someone say something, and they probably haven't even thought about what they've said. They've just instinctively said it because they've been trained to say it. So I was challenging the the sort of holy grail of um of <laughs> islamic polemics the idea you know muhammad had sex with aisha when she was nine years old and shamsi came in he tried to to demonstrate that this wasn't the case and he didn't realize that i had known certain things and i was bringing these up and it embarrassed him and it also embarrassed the people around <clears throat> around me 
and again, it's pitch black. All the all the Christian cameras had gone home at this point, so it was very foolish of me for staying, and I shouldn't have stayed. Mm-hmm. But there was a guy I heard to the left of me, and he said something like, "I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna kill you, basically, um, for what you've said." Um, and it was interesting because I heard it, and so did the crowd, and so did Shamsi. So Shamsi actually turns to this guy, and he says, "No, don't do that. Don't say that. We don't say that here." So he had to like discipline this guy because he could tell he was this guy was really agitated and he was starting to say some things that he probably shouldn't be saying. Um, now, fortunately for me, that's that's the end of it for me. Um, whether it'll happen in future, who knows? You know. Um, yeah. Look, but, I mean, let's. Yeah. What's what's the author? Oh, um, sorry. Wait, there was another time sorry? as well. Go on. <laughs> there, there was another time. Um, the, it's, it's kept on video as well actually there's a guy who came up to me and threatened me um, but he was threatening everybody uh, and he was yeah he he would just I can't remember what he said but it was it was it was some like I'm going to fight you and beat you up kind of thing very childish but other than that I think that's all I've seen well I'm going to go back to just um, commanding the right forbidding the wrong 713 so I think uh, I think it's I'll just bring that up to show people that. <clears throat> um, and then I have one more question because it's been a couple of hours. So I tried not to go more than two hours if if I can. I mean, the, the audience does not seem to mind. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, this, this again is the steps here. No, don't forget, this is, the, this is the religious obligation of Muslims. This is their great commission, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. And there must be those among them who do this. And this is their great commission. And these are the steps they must take. They can jump straight to the end. There's no need to follow in the sequence. So assault and force of arms are part of their religious duties. So, um, and I'd like to see a Muslim explain to me how assault and force of arms are, uh, what they really mean is, Lloyd, it means assault with a with a shaker. You know, assault with a pepper <laughs> shaker. <clears throat> You know, and force of arms is to use your arms and shake and go, no, you know, whatever. Yeah, but Lloyd, Lloyd, do you know Arabic? Darn it. I give up. (laughs) I give up. You got me there. You got me. I'm, I'm, yeah. So I have a final question. uh, This one, because this did come up in the chat, oddly enough. Um, Islam versus the British European identity, how to Christianize the British identity and oppose its decline. Yeah, so that's been something I've <clears throat> I've thought about quite a bit. When when we want to actually change culture, it's not sufficient to think that you can do it um, behind your keyboard, for example, right? Not culture. You you need to have people on the ground who are actually making a stand for things. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to the British identity, I am going to say. That as a part of what that should mean, should be found in Christ. In other words, you may not be a Christian. I, mean, I imagine a lot of people here are Christians, but there may be some people who are agnostic. There's at least or, one Brianist, though. Friendly. There's one strict Brianist we know of. So there's, there's one Brianist. Well, he, <laughs> heretical uh, belief. But um, <laughs> if he's willing to abandon his Brianist ways, um, then I think the best the best way to unite and to have an identity is a visual identity that people can see. Mm-hmm. And the way that you do that is you have people acting in accordance with a Christian value set. Now, a lot of people do this without even knowing they're doing it, right? You you can look at countries um, like Eastern European countries, Western countries. We often have Christ-like morals and values. We don't even know we do it. So the idea that um, self uh, self-sacrifice is a noble thing, that in and of itself can be traced back to the idea of Christ. You can look at examples where <clears throat> they wouldn't be followed in situ- in things that are truly secular or truly i guess you'd say uh in opposition to christianity but because we have these things in common we have something to unite behind and the only way you can show this in a in a practical way and have some actual effect on culture mm-hmm. is by is by going out and proclaiming it in other words it's not sufficient to say yeah well you know i'm christian in name you know, my dad and my mom was a Christian and maybe my grandparents were and I was raised, I went to a Catholic school, you know, that kind of thing. It isn't good enough. What you need to say actually is, <clears throat> no, the Christian the Christian worldview is the correct worldview to the exclusion of all others. 
especially the Islamic perspective. And by being a Christian who can say this, then you are actually going to make a difference and you are actually going to see things around you change. So in my, in my, uh, my own experience, because there are things that I, I'm calling myself to embrace that are more of the Christian faith. Um, so you could say, say for example, fasting, right? When you're fasting, you, you have an example of something that people can visually see. People at your work might notice that, you know, you're not eating meat anymore. You're, you're eating a lot less now. Mm -hmm. And I say, why, why are you doing that, Chris? Usually you, usually you, you like, uh, you would have this, this thing, but you're not now. Yeah. It's like, well, that's because I'm a Christian and I'm following the, the Lenten fast. From that, you don't, you, you've not evangelized. You've not done anything. You haven't even brought up the name of Jesus. All you've done is you've said, this is why I'm doing something. So you've offered and an example. You've, you've spoken yeah. and, and offered an example. You've, you've verbalized it and you've done it. So act and deed, you've shown someone. And, and thank you very much. You, uh, sorry, just one moment, please. Um, Yeshua the King, thank you very much for the donation. He asked me to do a talk on dummies. Um, yes, that's a great idea. I can do that for you. I have those notes and I can certainly do a one-off on that. It'll be well worth it. Um, that was certainly, uh, tell me something, Chris, while you're here, I mean, uh, would that be a subject that would be useful information to you that uh, dummies and jizya? Yes. Yes, it would. Then, Cause that is a topic that comes up at speakers. Call so how about well. you join me? We make a date, uh, two or three weeks from now, if that's okay. And we actually do a show. Would that be okay with you on a weekend, Friday or Saturday? Um, and we actually do that. Then, yeah, then, yeah, that should be great. Then I will, I will go through it. I'll go through the notes and you can give me your feedback and input and talk about your experience, how this is relevant at Speaker's Corner. But I have this ready so that, that so Yeshua, thank you very much for that suggestion. I will do this. So in March, I will certainly, um, I will do that for you. I will take, I'll tackle that one. And, and thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so please go on. I mean, this is really, I love your answer, um, what you're saying. And so please go on. <clears throat> sure. So <clears throat> once people can see that you're actually part of something bigger, you're not just an individual, right? You're not someone who, yeah, you have your opinions. You oppose the Islamic, um, the Islamization of Britain or of Europe. You actually believe in a British or a European identity or just the, the identity of where you're from, right? You can do it by holding fast to a communal belief, namely the belief in Christ. Mm -hmm. When people see you act this way, you're giving them something to latch on to, to join in with. Because that's what Muslim is, that's what Islam is doing. Islam is saying, look at us. We are visually different from you. We offer you a sense of community. You don't offer that anymore. Like, <clears throat> mm. one second. <clears throat> uh, Satan is still in my, my nose, I'm afraid. <laughs> but if <laughs> you can you can see what Islam is taking advantage of, and you actually see it in the in the wider political culture. <clears throat> there isn't much say, particularly for young men, to be able to come out and talk about the things that matter to them and the things that they want to achieve in life, right? In the modern age, Islam offers them something. It says, "Look, come come be a soldier for Allah, be a slave <clears throat> for Allah. Come join us at the mosque." We'll give you all these things. We'll show you how to do this. We'll set you up with a woman. That's genuinely something they say. And set you up with a woman. Them. Yes, yes. Holy uh, moly. So, yeah, well, what, what they mean by that is um, if you're looking for marriage, if you're looking for uh, nikah, cheers, Clint. we will, we will uh, we'll try and find you one. Wow. <laughs> it's basically what they mean. Um it hasn't worked for the for the Muslims that I know who are who are trying this, but uh, maybe it will. Maybe they, maybe they'll find these people uh, uh, a nice Muslim lady at some point. Um, just looking at the at the comments here, Chris on hospitals and universities, English Christian inventions achievements. Yes, um, it comes back from the scholastic period, where we had monasteries and we had places of learning. Um, scholastic theology is kind of like a precursor to the Enlightenment period. Mm -hmm. And things that flowed from that were things like hospitals, <laughs> were things like uh, like the the Christian charity that you see, and it's 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 an amazing part of Christian heritage. And I, to be honest with you, the, the more you look at things, particularly from the European perspective, we have an amazing connection with Christian heritage. It's something to really be proud of. Right. The things that we achieved and the things we did, and we need to recapture this if you want to reclaim the identity of of the British people, of wherever you may be, the Polish people, the Lithuanian people, the French people, no matter who, you, what group you're identifying with, mm. that's how you do it. Yeah. 
I, I just have a question off topic. Um, so Basil Get is a minister in in, London, in England, near London, not far from London, I believe. Chris, I'm planning to bring a group of about 35 confirmation youngsters to visit the Tyburn Memorial, the Tyburn Nuns, and also Speaker's Corner. Will that be safe for the large group of youngsters? And could you or Bob or Kay address them? Okay, uh, I've just found that comment. I'm just going through it now just to check. Because yeah, I can get you to in touch so if it comes to... Yeah. 35 confirmation youngsters. Okay, um, how... When you say they're youngsters, I guess, are they teenagers? Like, although are they children? It depends on the kind of age there and what they're, uh, what they're sort of comfortable with. Um, if you do come, and you can come, all I would say is you you keep an eye on them you you give them certain rules there'll, there'll be certain things that you should probably tell them in advance which is that uh, they don't have to talk if they don't want to they don't have to be on camera if they don't want to if they feel um intimidated because of crowds they, they can walk away um this might sound quite intense but I, I promise you it's it's just kind of to to predict some of the worst case scenarios a lot of the time, especially if it's in, uh, you know, it's a, an early day, the sun is out. A lot of the time, it can be relaxed and it can be it can be a good experience. Um, you just have to be mindful of the people you're talking to, what their intent might be, what the cameras are doing, and also what time of day it is. Um, we we will be there. I'll probably be there. Bob will probably be there, and others as well. Um, Soko Films will be there. We're there every week. We, we can keep an eye on them and do the best that we can. Obviously, there's like there's practical limits to this because remember we are the minority, so we we can only do so much. But if you feel that it's something that you could you could keep an eye on them and look after them, then yeah, mm. that could work. I think he says you'll have some adults along. They're thirteen plus, so if need be, I can maybe hook you guys okay. up yeah. um, one on one to chat. And uh, yeah. So ordinary blokes is might the king defend Christian faith and culture? Because I don't know Prince Charles. Who knows, right? I I don't know, but uh, the queen yeah, certainly. But um, um, but I mean they haven't exactly come out boldly. You know, I, even the queen didn't exactly come out boldly in defense of the Christian faith. Although she has said some amazing things in the past, but lately she's kind of been in the background. So yeah, so. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, when she died, I I had uh, I did a, I did a bit of research into this because I've never been I guess you could say <clears throat> too knowledgeable about the monarchy. Um, I've always sort of had an agnostic perspective on that. Like um, I hadn't done enough to done enough reading really to have a, an opinion. But doing my reading into Queen Elizabeth in particular made me realise that actually, regardless of your view on the monarchy, at the very least, she was indeed a passionate Christian. Yes, even if even if the things that she did as a monarch don't necessarily align with that, because you can find examples. Mm. Um, no, she, where, she's where given she some great speeches. Them. I watched one where she spoke about Britain as a Christian country and built on Christian values and Christmas and stuff, and she gives a beautiful speech on that. So I have seen that. But, but I mean, she's also been very non-involved politically with the country, but I think she should have maybe stepped up a little bit. Yeah, well, for example, you can talk about the fact that she didn't do anything regarding like, um, I think it's like abortion laws and things like this. But um, to put it in perspective, when she gave the Christmas, in this country, we have something called a Christmas speech, mm -hmm. where at Christmas Day, the monarch will will be on the TV. Uh, you know, you switch on, I don't know if it's like BBC or something, and you watch the king or queen give their speech. I think it's like 15 minutes in length or something like that. Mm -hmm. But when the queen was doing hers, particularly in the later parts of her life, she would often say, look, the example, the person to look up to is Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, that's pretty profound in a nation that's incredibly multicultural now, mm -hmm. or at least in, in London and big cities. Um, I'm worried we won't see that with Charles. I don't think he has that same kind of faith that, mm -hmm. he's, uh, that he's rooted in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, pray, I pray that the monarchy does, that he in particular does come to that same kind of faith. But who knows? Who knows? Right. Yeah, I, I should um, wind down here. I mean, this has been brilliant. Man, there's some fantastic answers. I think lots to... So to the audience, if you guys could could summarize your thoughts in the chat later. I mean, just, just add a comment for the algorithm. Um, but, you know, but also...
just add your thoughts in the comments later and say what kind of questions you'd like us to maybe tackle on the next one because that would be brilliant for for future discussions i mean these are some amazing answers they're not theoretical these are things you've had to stand your ground literally and deal with this and i mean this is fantastic because you are you are dealing with these people face to face you know this is um and then also uh, obviously to me to talk about this dimmies and jizia thing uh, and get your thoughts on that because you said it's a real issue that comes up. So now, now we kind of, the, the rubber is meeting the road. You know, it's not theoretical. This is practical. So it's a very different perspective. Yeah. I mean, I, I've learned a lot. For me, it's been very interesting. Um. <clears throat> I'm, glad, I'm glad it's been uh, it's been productive. I mean, yeah, I've been watching uh, a lot of your content for a long time now. So it's, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure being here and, and having a chat with you and uh, just, yeah, kind of, kind of having you as someone who can provide this content and do this kind of level of research has been incredibly useful for me. Well, thank as well you. as Islamic origins and that and uh, Thaddeus and Jay Smith and all those guys. Yeah, this is brilliant. I mean, so yeah, I'm glad I was able to to get you on my channel and to to introduce people to your work. I mean, I just thought that that, that short that you did, man, that's just powerful. You know, just really gr the quality of thinking, the quality of response, the, 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 just the response, the quality of the the answers, you know, the calm, clear, logical, coherent approach, um, but the strength, you know, that quiet strength. Um, I mean, I, as as you know, I would I would sort of um, I'm a little bit more of a bulldog, as people have called me, <laughs> you know. But well, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Like there's there's many different approaches to things. Um, I have the same approach, I think, as Paperboy has. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Not, I, I have Boy? maybe in the past no. watched, but I'm not that familiar. I, I've probably some time back. Uh, fill, fill me in. He's, uh, he's this guy that goes to Speaker's Corner who's been there a lot longer than me. He has done <laughs> some amazing things, amazing debates. Uh, and, he, and he does it with just a, a very humble, very calm attitude. And one of my favorites is when um, there was... There was this guy, a Dai, very well known Dai, who was saying his, his name's Hashim, and he was saying uh, that I think he was talking about the fact that there's, there's a prophet Isaiah who was naked, <coughs> excuse me, for a period of time in the wilderness, I believe. And what happened here is that he he was unaware of his own sources, right? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how you might find it. If you search for, um, yeah, this is just a, a frequent. This is just a video he was in, which is which is good. This is like a recent one. But in this debate, this is paper he was boy. unaware that Muhammad was naked. Yeah, this is Paperboy. Yeah, he he does uh, speeches as well. He does like presentations and he goes through things. All right, but um, very intelligent, very theologically based. I'll um, watch something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some real amazing people at Speaker's Corner that do amazing work. Okay. That, and, uh, like, I've learned a lot from this guy. Right. Yeah. I have a last question. If if I were to go there, what would the response be? Because <laughs> I haven't seemed to have made many friends over the years. <laughs> Wait, so if you go to Speaker's if Corner? If I were to go. Yeah, because I'm the only guy that's going, I don't care about this Quran and Hadith thing. Let's talk about the Sharia. I mean, what do you think they might think <laughs> if I were to go there? Well, first of all... Um, so, so it, it sounds funny, funny, but the first thing is, can, can you actually get them to talk with you? Uh, and what I mean by that is, so, like, I mean, they probably will, because a lot of them I don't think would recognize you, but um, there, is a, there is an element where as soon as you start speaking about things and they, um, they, they hook on that you know things, it will be kind of, uh-oh, like, let's not talk with this guy. Yeah, we're done now. That's kind of it. Yeah. Um, but also... What happens sometimes is they'll get a dai to come talk to you, and this dai will just speak over you. Like he 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 won't let you he won't let you say what you want to say. Okay. So you'll be there thinking, right? I've got all these references, got this material. I'm going to tell them about it, and they'll just say things like, um, "Well, okay, if you're a Christian, they'll say, um, explain the Trinity. How can God be three? You worship three gods. Your Bible has been corrupted." Explain to me, and they'll go into like lots of like uh, lots of Tao script stuff. They'll be like, "Why was Jesus baptized when he was? You know, what is the purpose of baptism for the forgiveness of repentance of sins? So why was Jesus baptized then if he was sinless?" They'll go through this entire Tao script that they've that they've prepared. If you don't say you're a Christian and you come in perhaps as like uh, as someone who refuses to say 
or maybe you know they get the impression you're something else they'll they'll have um they'll have this weird kind of like very old theist dialogue that i think is quite outdated and to be honest with you it's just kind of annoying because i don't think they present it very well but when they talk to atheists it's very patronizing it's very mm. you're a a dumb atheist who doesn't understand but they so like, they won't want to engage with me in terms of conversation they'll try to drown me out or ignore me no 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 they'll drown you out they'll okay. absolutely drown you out okay. so the only way you can get that you can do this is is by being bold enough to do one or two things either you go the aggressive approach and you just yell back and you yell louder this might be what you call the bob approach if you're familiar with bob oh yeah of course you're familiar with bob. yeah um or there's the other way which is that you just stick to your guns and you say no 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 listen to me i'm not interested in that i only want you to answer these questions about this topic okay will you have this conversation with me and you keep you'll have to say it like 50 times all right but eventually they'll be so frustrated with you yeah so it's not going to go anywhere because they obviously don't want to engage me at all um but yeah let's i I don't don't think so sorry but do turn up. <laughs> uh, it might happen. You never know. So, so yeah, we should call it a day because, man, we're going to keep saying we're going to finish and then we, like, two hours from now, we'll still be going. So, uh, uh, but yeah, this was brilliant. So, let's, so let's so um, so let's end it here and we'll, we'll catch up um, off camera. And, um, yeah, guys, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. I really appreciate the engagement, the questions. Um, and, yeah, this has been great. And thank you uh, for Thaddeus and Mal for being here. Um, you know, really appreciate the 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 presence this was great um chris this was fantastic and um yeah it's hopefully we get the chance to do this again soon on on this and other topics but certainly demise and josia will be a very interesting um uh discussion and um so yeah guys thank you very very much i need to go it's late here it's after 10 but chris thank you i'm really honored and i'm very pleased you were here i mean this was open mind i mean really just just really thought-provoking and um I was not aware of this, of the reality of what happens there. So thank you very, very much. It's been an absolute pleasure, Lloyd. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in and watching us. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for staying with us for so long. And uh, yeah, God bless everyone. See you all soon. Bye-bye.